Williams. This is Yasmin. I'm going to be taking Yasmin. Over. Okay. Can you take the roll for us, please? Yes, no problem. Carrasco. Perales. Here. Mayhem. Here. Esparza. Here. And Foley. Here. And I think uh, Carrasco is in the process of logging on. I'm okay. here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. The gang's all here. So let's move into the review of the work plan. We have several items that are being uh, recommended to be dropped. Does the committee have any comments? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the work plan. Motion, motion to, to approve. approve. Second. Is there a second, any discussion? If not, then uh, please take the roll. Sorry, Chair, we do have a public comment. Uh, on the work plan? Uh, yes. Okay. Hi. Oh. Um, hello. Happy uh, new week. Uh, end of April. Happy end of April. Blair Beekman here. Uh, I wanted to speak on the soft uh, story retrofit work plan. Um, I, boy, I'm learning really hard a lot to try to speak in very formal terms that you know as as yourselves as city government and many governments around the bay area have been doing recently you know how are we preparing how are we preparing for the next uh you know few years and next five to ten years for a possible earthquake in uh the bay area um i think this this retrofitting idea work is really important and it's things that Jackie Morales, five, six years ago, was talking about as ways to develop a, a real community harmony and ways that can actually give a, a lot of breaks to tenants uh, of apartment buildings and at the same time give breaks to the apartment owners and create a really interesting system and way of working that uh, can really help all sides of, of apartment issues and attendance issues. And, um, you know, we're dealing with these issues now. We, it's very quite possibly, we're possibly gonna have an earthquake in the next few years. That's what I'm learning and understanding. I don't want to be speaking these words in kind of a, uh, you know, over sensationalized way. I want it to be very uh, formal as, as we try to do these things. And I don't want it to be uh, politicized. I don't want it to be used as a political football at all. I'm simply trying to state the facts of what I'm learning and how we can learn how to talk about this subject openly and prepare together. And so we, we're not caught by surprise. And um, thanks for your patience and myself trying to learn how to do this during public comment time. And I just want to do a uh, respectful job at, uh, at describing what we're, what we're gonna be going through as, as the entire Bay Area in the next few years. So uh, uh, correct me where I'm wrong and learn to talk to me how I'm talking about this subject. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, no, with no more public comments, I'll go back to the committee and can you take the roll please? Carrasco? Aye. Perales? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. And Foley? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any items on the consent calendar. We have some reports to the committee and the first one is the Eco Economic Development Activities Report from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what do you have for us today? Well, council member, thank you for the invitation. Elizabeth Handler, Public Information Manager, Office of Economic Development. And I have a rich full menu of news for you today. The, uh, the May issue of the, uh, the SJ Economy News leads off with the announcement of the development agreement on downtown West. And um, it was probably one of the challenges of my career to uh, create a, a you know, 105 word blurb on something that is you know, over 300 pages long. Um, but I had to, you know, link it all to a blog post that's a lot longer than the usual ones. 
But anyway, it has the highlights of that agreement and the process that the city and Google have gone through to reach this point with some of the highlights around uh, the affordable housing and the opportunity pathways that were the heart of the community benefits package, which was what people were really anxiously awaiting news on. And um, at the same time, we also got uh, the news that the EDA, the federal government's economic development authority had presented the city with, or we had applied for and had been given a grant of $1.7 million for economic recovery that is more for capacity building than direct help to the community. Um, but it's going to enable us to do contracts with a lot of different community-based organizations and the organizations that we call technical service or technical assistance providers. These are organizations like um, A New America, they're like um, Silicon Valley SCORE, they're the folks who are part of our uh, business owner space partnerships that can help individual businesses apply for grants, apply for loans, analyze their tax situation, help with free legal services and so on. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing as well as um, helping to uh, accelerate some of Manufacture San Jose's manufacture and um, workforce development programs and working with the Downtown Association as kind of a mentor to other uh, smaller and other um, business associations that are kind of on, on, the, on the grow. So that's a very exciting project that's going to be uh, going on for a couple of years now. We've also been busily doing our webinars, and we're excited to be able to say that more than 2,000 people attended since just since January 1, the webinars that we've been holding on a weekly basis. And what we found is that there's a very, um, there's a lot of hunger for more discussion. Um, you know, the presentations are getting shorter and the Q&A periods are getting longer. So we're going to alternate our subject matter uh, presentations, webinars, with every other week with what we're calling biz chat, which is open forum discussion also as an online meeting. Um, we held our first one last week. And um, even though it was only 20 people, it was really representative of the kinds of businesses that we want to be working with. And we're excited about that. Now we're just trying to figure out how to do them in Spanish and Vietnamese as well. So the, the, the trek continues. We're, we're turning into quite the webinar production company. Um, I skipped one here, sorry. Um, no, I didn't. I just the, the various subjects that we've been doing our webinars on include uh, the American Rescue Plan, what's the Biden plan going to mean for small businesses, rebuilding business, how to make customers and employees feel comfortable coming into your business, um, SBA grants for performance venues, the shuttered venues operators grants, um, an update on the, on the American Rescue Plan, California Relief Fund opening its fifth round of applications, that's the kind of um, subjective, subjective content that we've been sharing with the business audiences. Um, we all know we went back to the orange tier uh, with, with great relief. So we did a, a pretty comprehensive communications round with the help of EPIO around getting back to the orange tier. And then we were happy to be able to kind of have a, a little sense of normalcy with the 408 Creates um, April is Creativity Month, which our Office of Cultural Affairs launched with their cultural ambassadors and um, an engaging program of things that people can do in their ordinary lives that um, bring out their creativity and kind of spark um, their, their artistic side. So that was it's still going on in April, so you can still jump on that website and um, participate, get into some of those activities, whether it's dancing or photography or pottery or cooking or singing or whatever is whatever strikes your fancy. And that's our report for this month. Are there any questions? I'm happy Wonderful, to thank you. Let's go to the members of the public. Do we have anybody who's raised their hands from the public? Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, 
I guess, you know, we're, we're trying to enter a new stage of uh, how to address COVID issues. Um, you know, in Southeast Asia, the COVID numbers are really rising right now. Um, so I don't think we're fully out of the woods yet. And uh, we have to really be mindful still. Um, I, I, I think our next stages of COVID, uh, we have to re really reconsider the ideas of, uh, of openness with each other and communication and education. And um, really consider those kind of ideas and principles and really reflect on how fearful this whole COVID thing was at first. And you know our initial lessons we learned from that time, uh, it's now time to like kind of maybe start to reapply them into the beginning next stages of, of, of COVID. And um, yeah, education and communication. It seems really important. How, how can we better talk about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccination process? Um, how can that be better trusted? and more than where we're at with it now. And um, how can we talk about HVAC systems in schools, in our institutions, in hotels? Um, will they be having a, a secondary kind of aerosol vaccine system? And is it okay to simply ask those sort of questions? How can we make that okay and safe? Um, my final thought is, is funding issues and, and how do we talk about our future of, of funding programs and 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 building our our future. Uh, what in what terms are we going to talk about it in, and how can how I I would like to be open about that process, you know, formal yet open, and uh, to to see what can develop uh, from this terrible time, and that we we never allow this sort of thing to happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Turning to the committee, does any committee members have any questions of Elizabeth regarding the Economic Development Activities Report? If not, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, and that is, thank you, thank you for the report and the uh, report about how many people have attended your webinars. That's really actually incredible. 2000 in the first quarter, that's great. So what, uh, and thank you for sharing the topics, but what was their uh, number one issue that ran, came to the top in their questions and, and concerns uh, aside from that surprise, let me put it this way, that surprised you? Um, it didn't surprise us, but the number one question by probably a factor of five over the next most interesting is access to funds. They are they're very, very concerned about getting financial help, financial support, hard cash money in hand to meet their bills and to be able to even just keep their businesses alive, let alone thriving. That really is the most important issue. Um, I would say the next one is probably help with addiction issues. It's a big deal for the commercial uh, sector as well as for the residential sector. And um, the advice that we have found is the most effective right now is get, get in touch with your landlord early. Don't wait to reach out to your landlord until he starts to talk to you about rent not being paid or issues of eviction. So, um, and having been able to have the Law Foundation as a source of free legal advice has been super helpful to us. Okay. But money is the number one. Good. Okay. That's, I, I, I assumed it was, but wondered if there was anything else that was jumping out to the, the small business owners. Uh, seeing no questions from uh, the committee, is there a motion to approve, to accept the report? Move. Is there a second? Second. Then uh, let's uh, let's vote. Carrasco. Aye. Perales. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Esparza. Yes. And Foley. Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, which is a citywide planning activities report. This is a verbal report. 
who will be giving this one, Rosalind? Is it you? Uh, no, it's not me. I believe that Jarrett Hart, um, division manager with the planning division at PPCE, will be leading us through the verbal report. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, Rosalind. And then thank you, Chair and Council Members, Jared Hart, Division Manager with Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, uh, to provide you an update today on uh, citywide planning section activities. Um, I'm also joined today by Michael Brio, Deputy Director for Citywide Planning, and Supervising Planners, Martina Davis, uh, Jennifer Pioze, Ruth Queto, and Jessica Setiawan. Uh, the Citywide Planning section focuses on long range planning and land use policy and ordinance work. So diving right in. Um, so one significant effort uh, underway is aligning the city's zoning ordinance uh, with the general plan. Uh, staff provided an update on this item back in September of last year and work has continued to progress on this. Um, Want to provide just a little bit of background. Um, since the city's first modern general plan was adopted back in 1976, the city has really never undertaken the work um, to fully align the zoning ordinance with the general plan, whether it be the text of the zoning ordinance itself or making sure a property zoning is consistent with its general plan designation. Um, San Jose has really taken a, a general plan first approach and relied on applicants to apply to bring property zoning into alignment with the general plan when they propose a development project. And that's largely through, um, has been through kind of plan development zonings, particularly when it comes to um, large residential projects and mixed use development. Um, so that, that strategy has worked for us in the past, uh, but, but doesn't any longer because of changing state law framework uh, that requires charter cities like San Jose to bring their zoning ordinance into compliance with their general plan. Um, in addition to state law, the mayor identified th this issue of uh, lack of conformance between the zoning ordinance and general plan as part of his 2018-2019 uh, uh, budget message and how it was hindering housing production. So to tackle this effort, um, staff has broken down this work into two broad phases. Uh, phase one involves updating the text of the zoning ordinance and creation of new zoning districts um, to align with the general plan. Uh, council approved the first part of phase one in June 2019, which included a comprehensive review and update of existing zoning districts to conform with the general plan. The second half of phase one, um, what we're calling phase 1B, is the creation of six new urban village and mixed use zoning districts that will directly conform and implement the urban village and mixed use land use designations of the general plan. Uh, staff's completed a robust community engagement effort for phase 1B that included multiple virtual community meetings, focus group meetings, uh, and a dedicated web page. Uh, and the new zoning districts will be brought to planning commission and the city council for consideration next month. Uh, staff is also concurrently working on phase two, uh, which is uh, of this work is you might call kind of like a match the colors on the map project. Um, and, and that's to actively rezone properties. Um, so the zoning and general plan match. Uh, so the goal here is that we'll no longer have, just to give you know, one example, like a property with a residential general plan uh, land use designation, but then an industrial zoning that, that it's had you know, since the first zoning ordinance back in 1929. Um, Overall, the outcome of this work, among you know some other benefits, is that it will it's going to bring the city into compliance with state law. It'll help streamline the development review process and facilitate high density commercial, residential, and mixed use development. Um, so the city's uh, currently undergoing the second uh, four year review of the general plan. Um, this this process includes reconvening the general plan task force to evaluate policy work items approved by council and provide recommendations to staff. Um, the task force uh, process concluded uh, in November of 2020 and with a total of 10 task force meetings being held. A handful of uh, follow-up actions are being undertaken prior to bringing uh, the policy work to council, some of which were requested of staff by the task force. So this includes a community outreach to inform policy recommendations for density and building height limits to facilitate mixed use residential projects in some neighborhood business districts 
uh, through policy updates associated with the general plan for your review. Um, also, uh, community outreach to the Coyote Valley property owners and tenants on the proposed policy changes related to Coyote Valley. Um, staff's also undertaking uh, the required CEQA analysis in an opportunity housing uh, cost effectiveness study. Um, and although not an action item requested by the task force, uh, staff has participated in numerous uh, community engagement events around opportunity housing since conclusion of the task force process in order to present information on this policy concept. Um, staff anticipates completing these items and bringing the package of policy recommendations to planning commission and city council for consideration in late summer, early fall. Um, and staff also plans on bringing forward opportunity housing to a separate hearing um, from the rest of the policy items just due to the significant interest in this particular topic. So next I'd like to provide a brief um, update on urban village planning. So the, the urban village major strategy, it's really a fundamental component of the general plan um, to plan for new housing and job growth um, while advancing the city's environmental goals particularly around greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, the strategy promotes the development of urban villages that are active, walkable, and transit-oriented mixed-use urban settings. Uh, to date, the city uh, has adopted 12 urban village plans and two are under development, um, that being Barrius Abart and uh, the North First Street urban village plans. So the Barrius Abart uh, urban village plan is scheduled to be considered by council in June. And then the North First Street plan will be brought to City Council in fall this year for con their consideration. Um, Southwest uh, Expressway Ray Street and uh, Eastside Alum Rock urban villages have grant funding and works currently underway to bring consultants on board and begin the uh, public planning process. Uh, the community engagement process for Southwest Expressway Ray Street uh, will be initiated in fall 2021 and then Eastside Alum Rock in summer 2022. Um, additionally, uh, based on council direction uh, to explore allowing mixed use development ahead of BART and to support implementation of uh, VTA's transit oriented community strategy, uh, staff will be undertaking a planning process to update the, uh, the Five Wounds Urban Village Plan, uh, which will uh, include you know, close coordination and support from VTA and a robust uh, community engagement process. And so that work's anticipated to start in fall of this year. Um, staff's also anticipating um, initiating work on the Capital Caltrain station area plan in spring 2022. Um, so that's, that's an item resulting from the Monterey Corridor Working Group uh, and supported by the task force recommendations from the general plan four year review. Um, so, you know, one, one clear message that, that um, we received from the general plan for your review task force um, was that staff should continue to prioritize urban village planning um, and development of, of new area plans. So to support this work, staff has applied uh, for funding through the local early uh, action planning grant program and the regional early action and plan development um, area grant programs. Uh, neighborhood plans proposed to be funded through these grant opportunities include the, the Five Wounds Urban Village Plan update that I just mentioned, uh, the capital, as well as the Capital Caltrain uh, Station Area Plan, um, a light rail consolidated urban village plan, which would entail developing a plan for multiple uh, small urban villages located along light rail stations. Um, also amending the Martha Gardens uh, specific plan, which is a housing crisis work plan item uh, and developing new urban village plans for the De Anza urban village and the Paseo de Saratoga, Saratoga Avenue urban villages. Uh, so moving on to the housing element update. Um, this is another uh, top, top priority of the city, citywide planning and a joint effort with uh, the housing department. So the Bay Area is, is headed into the sixth um, regional housing needs allocation or RENA cycle, which will last from 2022 to 2030. Uh, the ABAG Executive Board approved the methodology and draft RENA allocations um, back in January of this year, and the, the State Housing and Community Development Department approved the methodology um, submitted by ABAG this month. Um, San Jose has been allocated uh, 62,202 units for the sixth RENA cycle, 
uh, which is a 90% increase from the fifth cycle, but less of a proportional increase uh, than the allocations of our neighboring cities in Santa Clara County. Um, so to plan for the, the RENA allocation and, and as required by state law, uh, staff is working on updating the city's housing element, which is one of the required elements of the general plan uh, that implements residential strategies and outlines the city's plans uh, to building affordable and market rate housing. Um, the housing element includes a housing needs assessment, a sites inventory, constraints analysis, and a work program as well. Um, so community outreach um, for the housing element update will be initiated this spring. And then the final uh, draft housing element update is due to the state in January, 2023. Um, so some, just a couple other uh, citywide planning activities to note uh, today is that um, uh, one of them includes a joint effort between uh, planning and the Department of Transportation and supported by the, the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant, uh, which is to comprehensively evaluate and update the city's uh, parking requirements to facilitate and lower the cost of housing um, and support the general plan and Climate Smart San Jose's goals uh, to lower vehicle miles traveled and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The, the two uh, key components of this work include evaluating the elimination of minimum parking requirements for new development and also establishing transportation demand or TDM requirements uh, for new development. Community engagement for this uh, policy work is really kicking off uh, this spring and then ordinance updates are anticipated to be considered uh, by council in fall uh, 2021. Um, additionally, um, as part of the citywide anti-displacement strategy, uh, staff is initiating work on strategy number eight. This is known as a uh, yes in God's backyard, um, which would explore amendments to the general plan and zoning ordinance to allow deed restricted affordable housing under the public quasi public general plan land use designation. When the affordable housing is developed is a secondary use in conjunction with the primary assembly use of the property. Uh, staff's going to begin outreach this spring on this work and anticipate bringing policy recommendations to council and in, in summer or fall of this year. Um, related to this work and is directed by city council, uh, staff has also started work on policy changes that would allow school districts uh, to convert land designated public quasi public um, that could provide opportunities for affordable housing and generation of revenue for school districts. Um, Staff's begun outreach to the school districts on a, on a draft policy and aim to bring the proposed policy updates to hearing this fall, um, fall of this year, following additional engagement with the school districts. And with that, that uh, concludes staff's um, presentation today. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the report. Very, very detailed. Uh, turning to the members of the public, we are on the citywide planning activities, so I ask that you keep your comments focused to that item. The gentleman with the last four numbers, 5140, Mr. Sensini, you may speak. Welcome. Yeah, I'm just wondering where the unicorns and the rainbows are going to be for these projects, you know, because the electricity isn't going to be there, the water. Well, there won't be any natural gas because it's not allowed anymore. Where do you think all these people, they're going to they're gonna all take mass transit? You're going to limit the parking? Any, any kind of new urban village has, everyone's talking about this, how every time there's something new, there's no parking. Or like you have these cramped parking spaces that can barely fit a, a, a compact car. But once again, you don't have the utilities, you don't have the police force or fire. I mean, they can't solve crimes or even come out to a fire or, or a police call. It takes them an hour if they show up at all. And I want to know with all this construction, what kind of silica is going to be in the air? What kind of pollution are you going to have when you're doing all these construction projects at one time? It's going to be very, very bad. I used to live overseas. There was construction projects all the time, and I mean, the, the, the uh, air quality was terrible. And, and you really think that people are going to use county transit? They don't use it now. The light rail, it's a disaster. It's a disaster in Basel, Switzerland, where it's originally from, the whole system and the, the, the cars that they use or the, the light rail they use. It's terrible. And you really think that limiting parking is going to solve all these problems? 
and cram everybody uh, into these buildings and these stupid villages. You guys are crazy. Look at what's happening with COVID. We're supposed to be like social distancing and everything. Pandemics start when people all live together. That's why they're having so much problems in India and Europe where people live close together. And you want to recreate that? It's not going to work. And once Caltrain comes into capital, what's it going to cost to go to San Francisco? $50 round trip or more? It's not going to be economically sustainable. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look like Venezuela here if we're not careful. As a matter of fact, if you guys want that, just start building in the hillside. Thank you. With urban Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, I know our modern uh, thinking towards urban villages, uh, you know, it's been a bit... Uh, protected i guess um i i hope i hope as as you you know worked hard to build the urban village ideas that you are considering the new ideas of eli and vli and mixed income that can be a part of the urban village experience and i hope i'm, I'm not sure where you're at with that but i i don't think it's too looked on too favorably at this time but i i hope it is and i hope it can be um, if you if you build urban villages by the future of light rails in the future, can you work that uh, the urban villages aren't so much a um, kind of a fortress, but more of a plaza feeling instead of a fortress feeling? Because I think that's a big problem about urban villages that I've worried about. And um, yeah, so uh, and light with light rail itself, you know, it's. I mean, there is an incredible amount of arrests that go on and 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 policing, and it's it's not a very uh, accessible system for low-income people. I feel it's really it's kind of terrorizes people. I feel I think we really have to reassess how we feel about light rail and if how you're going to be building around uh, in the future, and uh, what that whole situation and, and, and paradigm will be about. Um, again, uh, just my, my love for mixed income ideas, like in the Google Village area uh, and throughout the city, I, I think it's just amazing what mixed income can do for our future. I think it's choices that it can offer can be incredible. I hope you can think about it and, and work on it with the MTC at this time and the state of California and really come up with creative imagined ideas towards the ideas of reimagine. Thanks. Thank you. Turning back to the committee then, does any of my fellow committee members have any questions? If not, I just want to affirm a couple of points that you made, Jared, and that is that the general plan task force recommendations will come in two parts, that the opportunity housing will come at a separate time. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, given the just the Kind of the media policy items we have with the, the four year review um, and the amount of interest there's been in opportunity housing, we felt it was best to separate them. You know, they'll come under the general, same general plan hearing cycle, but it, it come to two different meetings. Um, I, I think that's really critical because the, all of the items that the general plan task force moved forward to the council are very. Uh, complicated and lengthy in discussions. Uh, having served on that task force, we spent several hours on each issue and sometimes two or three days on each issue. So I'm glad to hear that we're separating them because Coyote Valley alone could take uh, a, a lot of public engagement based on what the recommendation is. So I, I'm really glad to hear that. That was actually all that I had to, to offer. Does Is anyone on the committee wish to make a a motion to accept the report. Move to accept the report. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, great. Then let's vote. Carrasco. Aye. Corrales. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Esparza. Yes. And Foley. Aye. Thank you. 
Okay, moving to the next item, which will I, I expect will have some just uh, more discussion than we've had on the other two items, and that is council priority policy priority number seven, review of cannabis land use and regulatory provisions. We have a status report update, which I'm so glad to see. Good afternoon, I'm Wendy Salazi, division manager from the police department's division of cannabis regulation. With me today is Deputy Chief Dave Tyndall and Sergeant Dave Woolsey from the police department and from the planning division um, of the Planning Building Code Enforcement Department are Martina Davis and Alexander Hughes. And from the city manager's office is Peter Hamilton. So I'd like to say thank you to each of them for their assistance with this policy work. So today we're here to talk about city council policy priority number seven, cannabis land use and regulation. We'll be going over a brief overview of our current program, our draft policy proposal, online survey results and business and community outreach that we've conducted. So on the next slide, we'll see a little bit of our current program. And just as a reminder, at one point, San Jose had as many as 120 illegal medical marijuana dispensaries. And then in 2014, city council approved the medical marijuana program with the collective model where collectives were required to be vertically integrated and 16 collectives made it through that registration process. And since then, council has opened up registration for standalone cannabis businesses in the areas of manufacturing, distributing, and testing, and also approved a cannabis equity ordinance. So today we have 16 registered dispensaries that are allowed to sell both medical and non-medical cannabis. They're allowed to have one retail location that's open to the public. They may also deliver to customers and they can have two sites for cultivation and or manufacturing that are not open to the public. However, I will note that only two have opened a separate cultivation site. Next, we'll see, um, just as a reminder in 2010, San Jose voters approved a measure which allowed the city to tax all cannabis activities at a rate of up to 10% of gross receipts. The current retail tax rate is 10%. And in June of 2019, City Council adopted an ordinance to update the tax rates for cultivation to 4%, manufacturing to 3%, testing to 0%, and distribution to 2%. So currently, the majority of the city's cannabis business tax comes from retail storefront and delivery gross receipts. The City Manager's Budget Office and the Finance Department are forecasting $17 million in tax receipts this fiscal year. So our recommendation to allow, um, sorry, Alex, next slide, please. Um, our recommendation would be to allow new retail storefront registrations and relocations in retail zoning districts instead of industrial zoning districts where they're required to um, be located now. We recommend maintaining a thousand feet from libraries, parks, schools, and increasing the distance, distances between retail storefront dispensaries from the current 50 feet to 1,000 feet. We're also proposing to prohibit new cannabis retail storefronts from opening in police beats with crime reports 20% above the average number of reported crimes. Retail non-storefront, uh, more commonly referred to as delivery only businesses would be allowed in industrial areas similar to cannabis distribution businesses with 600 feet from schools, child daycare, community recreational facilities, parks, libraries, and 150 feet from residential. On the next slide, we'll show you that uh, we are uh, recommending to allow the existing 16 businesses to register for our second retail locations and then allow uh, five new equity businesses um, to open in San Jose. And then, um, and then with the next slide, we'll kind of go over some of the eligible sites. All right, I'll take over from here. So uh, just one other criteria I think, Wendy, you didn't mention was we are proposing 150 feet from residential to the retail storefronts as well, um, which is the current distance requirement uh, in, our, in our code. So we're proposing to maintain that. 
Um, so we've been spending a lot of time doing some uh, mapping to kind of figure out where using these draft criteria, uh, we would have eligible locations. And so you'll see this map, obviously, at this level, you're not going to be able to really see much. It is on our website. We have an interactive map. So if you go to the city's website and search cannabis business ordinance, um, you can also get to it on planning's website. On the left nav, you would click on ordinances and then proposed ordinance updates. And we have a page on the cannabis ordinance that has this. Um, so we found that under today's zoning, we found approximately 120 eligible sites that could qualify. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean they're available or vacant or suited for um, this type of business. This is just simply using those, the zoning and the distance criteria um, that we are proposing. Uh, I, you see on there 60 additional sites if rezoned. Um, what that means, and the, actually based on some analysis we were just doing, it looks like it's a little bit more. Uh, as Jared mentioned, we are undergoing a process to align the zoning and the general plan. And so, uh, so I mean, once that's complete and the properties are rezoned to become consistent in, with the general plan designations, it would be additional sites. Um, we found that generally speaking, the sites are dispersed throughout the city. Um, we are not seeing huge concentrations in any one area like we were with our previous criteria that kind of kept them in industrial zones. And then, you know, the biggest limiting factor that takes it down from thousands and thousands of potential sites really to, to just that 120 we're seeing is, is predominantly the distance to residential. So we're proposing 150 feet property line to property line at this time. Um, which knocks out, honestly, most of the city. So we're going to be looking at that and seeing if that maybe there's a different way to um, parse that out, uh, maybe a different way to measure it. Maybe it would be building envelope to the residential property line or something like that. So that's something we're still looking at. I'm going to go to the next slide, Alex, please. So we ran an online survey. Um, it was from April 3rd to, uh, excuse me, March 3rd to April 9th. And we got approximately 100 and, excuse me, 950 responses. We offered the survey in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and simplified Chinese. Um, I will mention that the survey was not a true scientific survey. It, it, so we can't extrapolate this data out to say this is how the citizens of San Jose feel. Um, more generally, this is really just how the people who filled out the survey feel, but it's still a very, very good uh, data source for us. So we generally speaking ask people to rank kind of how they felt cannabis retail businesses were appropriate or not appropriate in various scenarios that often occur in commercial areas. Um, and so we didn't see anything stick out tremendously so. I mean, nothing was like 90% one way or the other, but you do see a couple uh, things that stick out a little bit. Um, for example, we're seeing a fairly high level of opposition to malls um to corner stores and neighborhoods not super unexpected we're just kind of curious <laughs> how people felt about that um we're seeing uh, kind of higher opposition to mixed use developments with uh residential above and then interestingly enough probably where we see the the highest uh positive responses sticking out would be uh, near another dispensary which we uh we're checking to see if people had concerns about them near being near each other and and that seems to be generally speaking either neutral or in favor of that and then strip malls um which was very interesting to us because strip malls tend to be smaller and tend to be very close to residential properties a lot of times strip malls have a residential behind it directly behind it so uh that was kind of interesting uh, to to look at that and think about our residential interface um what we're proposing next slide please alex and so uh, the other thing we asked, of course, we're looking at delivery only businesses, introducing that into the code. So we asked um, folks, you know, if they had any thoughts on that one. Uh, similarly, we found that near other delivery only businesses or near other actual retail dispensaries would be appropriate. And then again, kind of strip malls came out as the highest on that one downtown as well. Um, and next one. So we asked also people how, how far away should uh, cannabis retail stores be from residential uses? And we did try to contextualize that, you know, one house, three houses, et cetera. Um, so despite kind of saying I like strip malls, which tend to be right next to residential, we also got a result of more than 300 feet away was the definitely preferred response on that question. So again, it's making us look at, you know, maybe it's a path of travel, maybe it's a slight distance. Um, we may be looking at other stuff there, just trying to think through and digest these results. Um, yeah, next slide. 
And then finally, the big question is, should San Jose increase the number of dispensaries? Well, people who filled out the survey are fairly split. Um, it came out to 52% no, and then it was about 46% said yes, San Jose should increase the number of retail storefronts. So definitely not as strong, um, yes or no either way. And then a handful of people did skip that question. And that's it, I'll turn it back over to Wendy. Okay, and here we wanted to show you a little bit of um, some of our outreach that we did. Uh, we held one meeting with our registered businesses and another meeting uh, with the community. And um, part of the feedback that we received from the businesses is that um, they wanted a second retail location where our recommendation would be to have them re relocate their retail portion of their business to the new uh, zoning districts rather than allowing them a second location. Um, other things that they said they wanted the ability to open that second location again, they're still hopeful they get to um, in advance of allowing any new businesses to apply for registration. Uh, they support retail zoning as an option going forward and some even mentioned the desire to see urban villages village zones added. They mentioned San, uh, wanting San Jose to modify its buffers to mirror those of the state. Specifically, they wanted us to reduce our thousand foot buffer to 600 feet from libraries, parks, communities, and uh, community centers and schools. Again, they also like us to match the state and remove our buffer from residential use um, or to modify it to the 150 feet from residential use to path of travel, not property line to property line. Um, as Martina already covered that we're looking into that. Uh, they also supported allowing new equity business uh, businesses. However, they raised a concern that San Jose may experience what they said other California equity programs have, may have seen. The concern is that big business non equity owners are financially backing and using equity applicants to get retail locations opened in cannabis business friendly cities then those non-equity business owners buy out the equity applicants once the approval process has been completed, thus negating the goal to see equity business owners thriving in San Jose. And then also according to industry feedback, this um, buyout issue has been experienced less in delivery only businesses. So therefore they requested uh, the city uh, only allow equity businesses to open retail non-storefront or delivery only uh, locations. A request was made for the ability to manufacture cannabis products under state um, type seven manufacturing license using volatile solvents. And then there was a uh, concern brought up over uh, CEQA clearance, um, but the state is looking to extend provisional license timing since many cities in California, uh, like San Jose also do not require site specific CEQA clearance for businesses to operate in their cities, meaning that the state will need to complete the CEQA review. Uh, a concern was brought up um, about how the city calculates its annual operating fee and to uh, reevaluate and calculate based on other met methods such as retail versus non-retail businesses or based on business activity level. So staff will um, look at evaluating the fee calculation method in coordination with the city manager's budget office um, uh, through that tip of that annual process uh, and then many businesses stated their desire for San Jose to lower its cannabis retail tax. They say that San Jose's 10% cannabis retail tax is one of the highest in the state. And then um, at our community outreach uh, meeting, uh, some of the feedback was just they wanted to understand what was meant by sensitive use setbacks. Uh, they reminded us that cannabis was federally illegal. They liked the distances between businesses, but the business dispersion and residential setbacks may need to be different for downtown. Uh, they wanted to understand a little bit more about the purpose of the equity program. And then uh, someone mentioned wanting us to consider a social consumption option. And uh, we reminded them that that hasn't risen to the um, council priority uh, list yet, um, but we will evaluate that if directed. And then we, uh, they wanted to know what the tax rates are and what the tax is used for. And they were curious about the next steps for our policy approval. And um, basically, so you're aware also, we are 
uh, looking to do uh, conduct a CEQA study again. Uh, Martina had already mentioned that. And then our hope is to present proposed zoning ch uh, changes to the Planning Commission in July and then bring recommendations um, to full city council in August. So with that, uh, this- Let me just jump in really quickly. One other thing that I think was very, very telling about our community meeting is that almost no one came. Um, we only had 12 attendees at the community meeting and I will just share for context, you know, my team does, this is not the only zoning ordinance update community meeting we've held uh, since COVID times. And we've actually been seeing generally speaking higher attendance at our other meetings for topics that may seem even drier than this. So, uh, you know, to, to us in planning, I think that said a lot that this doesn't appear to be a hugely controversial issue. Um, because, you know, people have had no issues attending our meetings. We advertise this very heavily and just um, we felt that the, the lack of attendance was kind of telling us in itself that maybe people aren't feeling tr tremendously passionately, at least not passionately enough to log into a Zoom meeting to um, talk to us in person about it. So I just wanted to share that. Great. Thank you. Is that is that it for your report? That is. Okay, great. Thank you. That was very informative. I appreciate it. Let's go to the members of the public. Uh, phone number 5140. Yeah, SJPD. What does that stand for? San Jose pot dealers. You guys are pot dealers now, man. Years ago, you were busting people with a little joint stitching them up for who knows how much time in jail and fines, and now you guys are selling it. You should be ashamed of yourself. Who's down there today? McTindall and McLandall? Who's down there? One of you guys makes $600,000 a year. We're, you know, you guys are going to need this tax to be able to support your high salaries to do all these things. And uh, a lot of these permits were taken away from people after they paid for them, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, the city council votes to uh, limit it down. So, the, you know, the, the city and the police department, or the, uh, the pot dealers, not the police, the pot dealer, not a, not a police department anymore, was able to take all that money for permits and then close everybody down real easy. They probably took all their marijuana, too. As for the taxes, you guys are getting into usury and gold bricking uh, for these things. You're going to wonder why you don't have uh, uh, any money because people are just going to go back to Joe the pot man in the Santa Cruz mountains. You know, it's going to be too expensive, which is going to be funny. You won't be getting the revenues that you think. I know Perales thinks that uh, they should be getting more. The, the teacher and the policeman who wants legalized marijuana. This, this is great. What a, what a, what a classy city council we have. But yes, yeah, SJ uh, pot, to pot dealers. You guys are, you guys are real class. You guys are keeping it real classy want to have more retail operations and everything what you need to do is have all the pot shops and the pool halls and the tattoo parlors and the massage parlors keep them all in one area we can like have a red light district like amsterdam maybe legalized prostitution too i mean while you're at it why not i mean because anything goes right as long as people pay the money for taxes and, and fees and, and permits and all these things you guys are you guys are Turn it into an Amsterdam. I mean, get Thank it over. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Jane, Hirsch Jane. Hey, council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Hirsch Jane, and I'm here representing Kaliva, one of the uh, existing 16 retailers uh, in the city. And just wanted to share a few thoughts. Uh, the first is, you know, we're really encouraged that the city is considering allowing the 16 retailers to relocate. You know, we've enjoyed being part of the District 7 community for the past six years, along with other retailers. But we think cannabis retail should be more evenly distributed throughout the city. <clears throat> and I'll also just say that I think, you know, the, the rezoning has the potential to really improve the city's cannabis market. Um, I noticed earlier on the presentation that the tax receipts in the city continue to increase year after year. And, you know, we think that relocating would further boost the city's tax receipts at a time when obviously the city is, you know, still recovering from the, the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. And as many of you are likely aware, there are other cities in the Bay Area, like Redwood City and Union City, that is now allowing cannabis retail 
um, in normal retail zones. I know that Union City, for example, is allowing cannabis retail now in its Union Landing shopping center. So um, we think this will help San Jose remain a leader in, in California's cannabis economy. And you know, also the foot traffic that you know, these cannabis retailers would draw to neighboring businesses um, would also be beneficial to those businesses. Um, I, I did want to say, though, that if you know, the expanded zoning is to be impactful, the city really ought to take a look at rev revising its sensitive use restrictions to align with the state. You know, we were looking earlier at the number of properties that would be eligible under a rezoning, um, but obviously many of those properties won't be available. So I would hope that the city takes a look and, and can determine that the state's sensitive use restrictions are sufficient. Uh, the, the final thing I'll, I'll note is that I know the city is considering issuing second licenses. That's something that, that we would support. Again, you know, if, if you take Long Beach, for example, which has half San Jose's population, it has 32 retailers. San Francisco, which has less than San Jose's population, has about 40. So we think the city can support second licenses and that the best folks to hold those licenses are the operators that are already known to the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next is Dan. Giorgados, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Thank you. Hello, distinguished members of the Community and Economic Development Committee and City of San Jose staff. My name is Dan Giorgados, Director and Chief Legal Officer with Purple Lotus. I'm also a proud San Jose resident. The City of San Jose's cannabis program has thus far been a successful balancing act providing medicinal and adult use cannabis access to people while safeguarding and securing the San Jose community, also contributing to the local economic engine of the beautiful Santa Clara Valley. Purple Lotus supports the effort to have five equity applicants operate in the city. This effort is likely best accomplished through delivery only licenses. After a period of initial successful operations, the licenses may transition into a storefront. The delivery channel is growing and any successful storefront operator must diversify their sales to channels that match this shift in demand. The city of San Jose will be setting up the equity applicants for success with this process. The delivery only launch also lessens build out requirements and allows a quicker launch for equity applicants. Relatedly, Purple Lotus also requests the current 16 operators be allowed to partner with an equity applicant or open a second retail location in San Jose. As for staff's recommendation to allow non-equity delivery only applicants in industrial areas, this is the quickest way to having pre-pandemic traffic back and also harm the quality of life for San Jose community. This will also harm the current 16 operators. Although Purple Lotus was forced into an industrial area by the city and has spent millions of dollars upgrading the building, we also support open zoning for cannabis. Finally, we request the ability for a type seven manufacturer's license. Now, on to the most important legal and policy issue that confronts the city's cannabis program. Mandatory site-specific sequel clearance for its current operators in order to obtain a state annual license. In short, the CDFA has responded to Purple Lotus that San Jose currently has no pathway for CEQA compliance, effectively meaning that all current operators in San Jose will have to cease their, at least their cannabis cultivation operations by the end of this year. In my opinion, this can be fixed by city manager uh, regulation that authorizes or mandates the planning division to conduct a discretionary site-specific review through Appendix G or other CEQA exemption uh, materials. And planning is the best lead agency here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Michael. Um, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael and uh, I own and operate White Fire Dispensary in San Jose. Um, we're very privileged here in San Jose because really we set the foundation for the rest of the state and had um, a program in place before the rest of the state did several years ago. So it was with the leadership of the planning department and the city council uh, that really led and had the vision to be where we are today. Um, I do encourage though that over the last five years, we've seen sales actually almost double um, in, uh, in within the city. And I really feel that adding a second location to the existing 16 operators makes business sense. Also, um, in regards to the setbacks, um, you said it yourself um, with the review, 110 properties are actually uh, qualified for zoning. And we know the vacancy rate right now is uh, in the single digits. So how much properties are really available? I believe on expanding that notion and um, expanding the, the footprint would allow us to have more properties available. And the way of doing that is just really copy the state regulation and their setbacks. 
with um, the residences and the schools. Uh, there'll be more opportunities. In, in regards to the equity portion of it, I believe and I do encourage the social equity aspect for the deliveries. I believe starting off with the, deli the, the deliveries makes sense. And then we can see over the next couple of years where it goes from there. But I really truly feel that the system that you guys have set up has been the pinnacle for the rest of the state and um, has been copied by many municipalities um, just south of us, Monterey County, the basis of their county ordinance and uh, the city of Salinas was based on San Jose. So I encourage you guys to continue being leaders, but um, follow some of the state guidelines that have worked uh, throughout the state. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Final speaker is Fernando Alvarez. Hello, and thank you for your time. Um, my name is Fernando Alvarez, and I'm the founder of Vapor Tent Lounges. We are licensed by the BCC for cannabis events, and we were actually the first business licensed in California. Um, and I want to continue to advocate for the social consumption policy, although I do understand and realize that it's not a part of this discussion. I do believe it is a land use discussion, and it is also a community and economic development issue. Um, since 2018, multiple cities have passed social consumption policy. I know this because I'm the one that helped develop and pass those policies, and it is a land use discussion. Um, here in California, even California Travel Association created a cannabis tourism division because they understand that there's a hospitality and tourism piece to this industry. And when you look at multiple states now, like New York, Nevada, which are heavy on tourism, they're also creating social consumption policies here. And so as a resident of San Jose, um, and as the first business license in California, I do want to continue to advocate for social consumption because what essentially was a three-year advantage that we had over the entire United States is kind of falling by the wayside because more and more cities and states are passing this social consumption policy. And I just want to continue to advocate that for that here in San Jose, especially because we want to be able to work with the local arts community, the downtown recovery effort. And when we talk about business to business or different type of events that we can bring to San Jose, um, I would definitely like to do that and just want to continue to advocate for social consumption policy here in San Jose. By the way, I also added a letter to this that will allow uh, a little bit more background on um, uh, social consumption policy here in San Jose. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, final speaker is Sean Kelly Ray. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Sean Kelly Rye. Uh, I, I represent a number of clients that have various opinions on this issue, but I, I just wanted to sort of highlight the success of San Jose's program, which you've heard many times has been, frankly, uh, the fact that we've had communication. Uh, being able to call Wendy on her cell phone or at the office or Dave Woolsey or interacting with Martina or, or even with Rosalind is really the reason we have success in this industry is because We've had communication. And last year during COVID, uh, I mean, probably other than my wife, I was probably calling Wendy as often as I possibly could to get some daylight on what was happening with uh, essential and not essential. And so I just want to uh, say thank you to them and, and make you aware of, of how hard they work. And that San Jose's success is not just because we're lucky, because people are working hard behind the scenes. Uh, but then second, uh, if you have any questions regarding any of these uh, items. I'm happy to take any questions uh, if you have them. So thank you all for your time. And, and thank you also for speaking with me. Uh, I know I've reached out to a lot of your staff and also to you personally. So, so thank you all for engaging in the conversation. Great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, someone may have questions for you. So uh, I'm sure they'll ask if they, if they do. Uh, turning back to the committee then, uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um so first, uh, thank you. I know that this is uh, a lot of work. It's been going on for a long time. I think uh, my first council memo, or my first memo as a new council member was back in 2019, and it was the cap on cannabis. <laughs> so, um, so I'm aware of how much work uh, has gone on since then, um, and obviously before then. Um, and so I wanted to just give some feedback on a few items and then ask some questions um, so that I could better understand how we got here. So first off, um, 
District 7 has by far the, the majority of, uh, of cannabis uh, operations in the city. Um, the rules were written that way. I have already stated um, many times that um, I don't feel that this is equitable um, to have this uh, concentrated in a part of the city that uh, yes, we're industrial, we're also already dealing with a lot of other issues and my residents would um, prefer not to have any more in District 7. Um, and so that's an issue. I, and one of the items that has come up are, is the sensitive uses. And so I, I wanted to also thank you for that. Um, I have um, some schools kind of nearby and when it was still the Wild West as a school board member, um, when it was the Wild West, we saw a lot of issues. And so San Jose's approach has largely helped that um, out in the community, but um, having youth involved um, or youth tempted is a concern and the families in my district would prefer not to do that. So I very much support the, the sensitive setbacks. Um, and, uh, and what I wanted to understand uh, was, uh, and I also wanted to support uh, downtown being studied to both, um, we'll hear from the downtown council member, but uh, I know that that's a more complex issue. And I realize that that's being studied separately and that seems appropriate to me. So I had some questions about the 20% um, the above average um, in the police beat, um, which is basically my district, <laughs> right? My council district. And so, that 20% above average crime in the police beat. And yet when I pulled some uh, the parcels, um, there are some parcels, for example, a, a market on Monterey and Center, right? How did we get to that? How, did, how does that parcel at Monterey and Center, how, how does that not meet the 20% increase in uh, or above average crime in, within a police beat? So thank you for the uh, question, Council Member. I'll take a stab at that, answering that portion of it. So in regards to the 20% portion of it, um, when we looked at these specific sites or when we pulled the numbers, uh, it was by police beat. So as you uh, are well aware, there's uh, obviously your council district, uh, but also from the policing standpoint, we have police districts, and then those are broken down into police beats, which in your district, uh, as you're well aware, District Lincoln is broken down into that specific area into six different beats. So when we look at that, that's gonna look at the geographical area within those beats, and it's gonna give us that number. Uh, and I'm not sure if Wendy has that or if planning has that as far as what the specific number was um, in that location. Uh, but that looks at the geographic area when it looks at the, when, uh, when we look at essentially pulling those numbers. Now, what I would say, and certainly PD would commit to it, is if there's a specific parcel and a specific site around a proposed location, then we could certainly take a deeper dive into that specific location and really get down to into some micro numbers uh, around that area to see whether or not it would be number one from the zoning purposes, but also from the uh, PD public safety standpoint, a good locate location um, for a uh, proposed plan. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would still appreciate a more in-depth response in the future. I think there are Can a lot of you said Center Road. You, you're seeing sites on Center that are that's eligible. Right, yeah, Monterey and Center is one of the I'm, sites. I'm not seeing. Well, Monterey and Center don't. Well, it's a. Sorry, let me pull it on my map. There. So, yeah. So just so you, um, there is one on Monterey and Lewis. There's a, right. Hold on. Let me find it. Oh, I'm just sorry. So uh, what I will say is that on the map, we, we actually showed in blue the sites that would qualify if they weren't disqualified by the police feet. So I'm just wondering if maybe that's that. Yeah, would be there's a the market. Let me pull it up. I missed speaking. Would you like me to screen share? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, we, and we can always, of course, look at it later. Definitely. Yeah. So, so but, um, I will say your let me, district. Let me, let me finish and then we can get back to that because um, I, I do have some parcel specific question. So for example, the parcels at 2900 Monterey Road 
and the parcels at 3000 Monterey Road would be within a thousand feet of an existing cannabis business. Um, so that's a concern. Um, the Caltrain station park and ride, which seems like a strange parcel to include in a cannabis dispensary list. Um, that is, as we just heard in the um, update, uh, that will actually ultimately be um, the uh, capital Caltrain station area plan, which is set to add 700 new housing units. Um, and so, but it's not that yet. So it's a, a strange parcel to me. And then at 3060 Monterey Road, um, that's about 1100 feet from Urban Leaf as well. And also about 1100 feet from Dahl Elementary and approximately 160 feet from residential. So it's like just outside. Um, and that is, that is not, I, I'm, that's, I'm a little shocked because that is um, not below the 20% um, that we were just talking about um, in those areas. So that's, that's one of my questions um, about some of those strange sites. Uh, let me pull up the other one. Um, Gosh. Okay. All right, I'm missing something here. But but so those three sites, can you talk a little bit more about those three sites, please? Yeah, so so the I'll just start with the park and ride. So we didn't actually look at what the site is being used at now or whether it would be appropriate. This was just an analysis looking purely at zoning distances, right? So you're absolutely right. I mean, the BTA parking lot, unless BTA wants to allow someone to build a cannabis business, is extremely unlikely to ever have that happen. But just from a purely, does it meet those distance criteria standpoint? The answer, yes. So that is that is why it's shown on the map. Um, we can double check it, but this was our latest data that we had on the police beats. So there is that section of District 7 that you see the sites in purple that did not show as being in the in the police feet with the over 20%, but we can definitely double check on that. Um, the other one, as you said, yeah, I mean, a thousand and one feet away is more than a thousand feet away. Um, one other thing, you know, we didn't actually exclude the distance from the existing retail cannabis businesses because we were, our proposal is that they would move. And so assuming one move, that that is a very good point. On a land use designate, um, if, if they came in for a zoning verification and that, that business that's not a thousand feet away hasn't moved, it wouldn't qualify. So that is something that actually we probably, sh we can uh, update the map to show the existing locations and show if those weren't to move, then it, it may disqualify some new locations in your, in your district. The other thing I'll note is the, it's those handful on Monterey Road they're actually, a lot of them are within a thousand feet of each other. So when you do that, it really actually brings it down to if they were all eligible sites, even based on this map um, taken, they would, some of them would exclude each other as well. Just wanted to note that. Thank you. And I, um, I did find it. I got a little uh, scrambled with all the additions. Um, the site at Monterey and Center is uh, at 4144 Monterey Road, um, where they join. Um, so that's, a site, again, I was a little shocked. Um, so if you could look at that again as well. Um, yeah. Happy to talk offline on that. Yeah, no, you're that's, yeah that's I think that's a gas is, station, right? No, it's a market. It's a market okay. with the gas station, yes. With the, But it's one of those strip malls. So there's some other sites in there, yes. Um, no, I mean, we can definitely take a look, but just this was based purely on the distances and the zoning based purely on those. Um, our analysis showed it worked. And, and as I, I didn't mention, but this is a snapshot in time and it's not the end all be all right. So any business, if they were to come in, would need to submit a zoning verification and we would you know, do a much, much, much more careful review on the distances at that time. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. And 
Lastly, I mean, I'll just say I've heard from businesses that don't want to add and, and other businesses that do want to add additional locations. Um, I do, um, I think adding the five equity businesses, um, I think provides opportunity to folks that are looking for opportunity. Um, that's it for me right now. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and appreciate the, the update from staff as well. Um, this has, I think, been some time coming, and, and I do appreciate that the city was at the forefront many years ago. Um, and I think we, uh, in being in the forefront, uh, we attempted to be extremely cautious um, in how we allowed uh, the distribution and sale of, of cannabis. And um, I think uh, it, it still has put us in a, in a advantage uh but at the same time now i think what we're seeing is as the state has legalized cannabis and as we're seeing other neighboring cities embark um in things like allowing uh the, the distribution of sales in retail locations uh we're starting to get surpassed and and I, I would love to be able to keep our competitive edge when it comes to the, the taxes that we're able to generate from cannabis uh, clearly, which as we, we heard in the presentation uh, is, has been growing and it is a huge benefit to the city. But I think even more so, and this is something I've been hearing from my community members for quite some time, uh, is quite simply just the, the access to cannabis uh, that our community members are desiring. This is something that has passed at the state. Uh, it, is, it is not 10, 20, 30 years ago um, when cannabis uh, was something that was being cracked down upon by the from the from the federal government uh, through uh, all the way down to the state and local municipalities. Um, we are in a different time, and I think we're fortunate because of it. Uh, my uh, mother-in-law, unfortunately, who who died of uh, cancer just uh, a, a week um, and a half before my son was born, was able to, to ease some of her suffering in the last uh, year of her life through the use of medicinal cannabis. And that was something she had never done in her life uh, and, and was really hesitant to, to partake in that use because unfortunately of the stigma that our community has put upon that. Um, and, uh, and it really took her some time to come around to it. And, um, and ultimately as she did, it, it was a huge benefit uh, to how she was able to live out the remainder of her life. And, uh, and as we know, not only in that regard in the medicinal use, um, but uh, in the recreational use uh, as, as has now been allowed, uh, I think uh, it, it's beneficial to us as a city and it's beneficial to our community members. Uh, and I think we saw in the results and I thank you staff for pointing out, um, I think that was the most uh, authentic response of, of what a survey results could mean, that it's simply just the responses of those who responded. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily scientific in any indication uh, you know, beyond that. I would say even the best pollsters out there uh, that do scientific polls, um, at the end of the day, always you know, provide disclaimers that say, you know, I mean, it, they may give you the best data possible. Uh, but it still doesn't give you a true indication of what the overall community um, opinions are. And, and that's just the case anytime that you're, you're getting um, some, some polling results like that. But I, I, I appreciated seeing them even still because in the presentation, as was pointed out, there's really you know, still some split interpretation on it. Um, and I think we saw that in the, the vote. I think it was uh, pretty overwhelming throughout the state. There were certain counties that uh, were, were a little bit more uh, even. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing, even in just this, um, the survey results that, that we were able to achieve. Uh, I will say specifically as a council member for the downtown community that I have been hearing from my community members for some time that they would uh, love to see uh, a, a, a retail storefront, um, not just a, but, but uh, maybe a, a couple throughout the downtown core. And uh, there are many individuals that choose to live in our downtown core as they do other downtown urban environments that don't drive vehicles. They specifically uh, don't want to, right? They, they want to get around by walking or biking or taking public transportation. Um, and Councilman Burr Esparza will attest to this. Uh, you cannot get out to the dispensaries that are located throughout her district very easily. Um, and, um, and, and, and we're quite frankly, um, we're, we're providing a disservice to our community and, and those, um, especially 
that are, are disabled uh, and living within our downtown core or those that simply don't have a vehicle and, uh, and not having a, an ease of access of, of a retail location in, in an area like the downtown core. Uh, so I, I, I'm very supportive uh, of, of this work as we're moving forward. Um, I do think I have a couple concerns and, uh, and namely it has to do with the, I think the still the limited number of locations based on the, um, the sensitive uh, receptors or sensitive locations that, that we have um, looked at it and, and created, uh, I think a, a distance, right, for for where uh, we're looking at, at maybe locating these additional retail locations. And so in my understanding, the states looked at a fairly simple restriction of 600 feet uh, from a school and um, the, the specifics are providing instruction in kindergarten or any grades one through 12, a daycare center or a youth center that is in existence at the time the license is issued. And um, can, I know that was, that's pretty minimal what they were looking at. I'm not necessarily, I think, uh, indicating that we should be there, but I'm curious, why is it that we, we have added in so many more, well, maybe kept in, right? Because we've had a number of these already, but why is it that we've kept in uh, a number of these restrictions and specifically as staff points out, the 150 feet from any residential use um, that really minimum, you know, minimizes us from potentially maybe a thousand or so new sites down to just a handful with what's available. I know it was around a hundred and some, but really with, with the vacancy availabilities, we're talking about just a handful. So why is that the case? Uh, well, I think we, from the police department's perspective, we're always, you know, interest of public safety. And so I, I mean, I quite honestly, I think the thousand feet from libraries, park, libraries, parks, communities, uh, out, you know, and schools and things are working. And we've seen um, a lot of negative feedback when other cities, when we've watched what they've been proposing to go 600 feet. And then when you look at it on a map and you look 600 feet to the parking lot of a school, um, a lot of the community then uh, ha does take issue when you see how close that really is. So uh, we believe there are uh, there are options available with the thousand feet from from those sensitive uses. And again, um, we don't want to desensitize really kids to cannabis so much. Uh, you know, our our concern is to keep it out of the hand of youth, right? And and to limit uh, driving under the influence. So I, again, we want to keep it away from from some of those areas, you know, as best as we can. Um, again, Martina said that we can look at the 150 feet from residential. Again, with that with that survey, we did see you know kind of some mixed feedback with you know not maybe not really understanding uh, what that what that sensitive uh, receptor setback or that that setback would be. So if we look at path of travel, then then there would be um, a lot more uh, parcels available uh, if if we remove that one or if we you know evaluated that a little bit differently. Um, you know, again, and we, the police department supports the thousand feet from the schools and libraries and libraries and parks, but um, again, it's council policy can direct something different. You can direct us to match the state. Um, it's just that that tends to be where the feedback comes in of once you finally get there, then the community does have an opinion on that. Yeah, and I'll just add, we, we already were, and I shared this at the community meeting, we definitely do now. We've done this first round of, you know, analysis mapping, we're doing outreach. We, we kind of were planning on taking another look at downtown, um, the downtown core, as we know, for many uh, different planning reasons, given the relative density, the proximity of residential, you know, we want people living downtown above the commercial. Um, so a lot of those distance requirements that imply that they're going to be separated don't work for downtown. So, so certainly in particular, as I said, that residential distance for downtown, it becomes almost a deal killer. So we'll, we'll be looking at that. We, we just wanted to get a sense of what the, the community, what, you know, what we heard from the community and what we heard from you on sort of the desire to do it, have them um, in the downtown core before we then start uh, kind of taking another look at that. So uh, I think we've heard okay. desire, so, so we'll be taking another look. That's helpful. So, I mean, it sounds like uh, what you've put out here, you're looking for this kind of feedback in regards to, to obviously what, whether it's from the community or from the council here. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And where, without getting into any specifics, where 
my ultimate goal would be, it would be if we're going to make these changes and allow for these secondary retail locations and say these, these five new equity uh, uh, ownership locations, for me, it would be, let's not do so and only have a small handful of opportunities to really grow into or, or for these sites to move into, right? Let's do so and let's make it uh, meaningful for, for this, this effort we're going through. Now, at the same time, uh, I would agree with what Wendy was saying, and I actually don't really have uh, too much of an issue with the thousand feet from like the, the, the schools and the daycare centers, rec centers, parks, libraries. I would agree with that. And it sounds like that's not necessarily the, you know, the one policy or the one, the one parameter that's holding back a lot of sites. It really does sound like it is this, this 150 feet from, from residential. Um, and, uh, and I think at the same time, right, that none of us would be expecting that, that, you know, um, that, a that a dispensary or retail dispensary should, should be located in just about any neighborhood. But at the same time, I think when you make this restriction, uh, and you limit it so, um, so much, then it really takes away other opportunities. And, and I would say as much as I'm supportive and you've heard here today on the downtown core, maybe having a different set of parameters. And I think you're, you're receptive to that as well. I also don't want to see just a major shift from what we've, you know, where council members far as saying, Hey, look, there's a much, uh, too much of an over-concentration in D7. I don't necessarily want that shift just to fall into to district three and say, Oh, now there's an over-concentration in district three. And again, I don't think that's what's equitable and that's not what our community is asking for. Um, right, the city of San Jose is uh, a, a very uh, broad and diverse city, and and, um, and and you know I think it, it's it's equitable to be looking at the opportunity in retail locations throughout the city, and um, and that's really where I'm hoping. And I think, and you know, when when you presented this, when I looked into, it, and obviously as we've heard back from a lot of the dispensaries that uh, currently as it stands, especially with this 150 feet from any residential use, really limits the opportunity. And so I, you know, I think that's where I would focus my um, comments and interest on where we may wanna make some tweaks and changes, be it a separate look at downtown, and then uh, specifically looking at maybe uh, eliminating this residential use um, and, and, or the, the 150 feet from residential use, and, uh, and then seeing what, um, what opportunities that presents and, and what challenges as well. Um, let me look back and just see if I have any other questions or concerns. And I don't at the moment, that's it, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Council member Carrasco. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I just wanna uh, to thank you for all the work that's being done uh, this is a, a, a this is a policy that we've been working on for for quite some time, and of course, it started way before I even got to council. It's just that uh, it's it's uh, continuously evolving, <clears throat> and uh, and 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 I, I want to be upfront. I, I I mention this uh, quite often every time that this policy comes up. I uh, as a mother of four children. Uh, they're still my babies, even though two are now legally adults. You know, I'm, and also as a former social worker, you know, I've never been a fan of cannabis, but because uh, because the world is is uh, quickly evolving, maybe, well, maybe not quickly evolving, but it has evolved, and because this is an issue that uh, that has been one um, that. Uh, that many of us have had to catch up to. Um, I, I've become I become a, a big supporter in the direction uh, in terms of where cannabis, the use of cannabis, access to cannabis, and uh, and when we talk about equity, has moved into, uh, and whether uh, we're, whether we're talking about the aspect of business or the medical use of it. As Councilmember Perales spoke about uh, his mother-in-law, uh, I'm one that I wish I had known more about it when my father was, uh, uh, you know, bedridden with Alzheimer's. As I'm reading more and more about it, and understanding what I could have done, uh, either as a preventative measure or an intervention uh, um, measure, 
And then, of course, uh, many of you know, my mother passed away of uh, skin cancer a few years ago. And because I, because of my own ignorance, uh, I, I didn't use it as a way of alleviating her, um, um, her very painful last days. And I wish I had just known more about it. And so I, I have now, you know, I don't want to say I've been baptized by, but definitely I've become a much stronger advocate of, uh, of the industry for so many, for so many reasons. Uh, and so, so I'm just, uh, I, I just want to thank uh, staff. I want to thank uh, uh, Wendy. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, David Tyndall. And I want to thank uh, everybody that's here for your, for your work. It's not easy. This is a very complicated issue. And, and I get that. And uh, so, uh, so, so a couple of things I guess I, I want to ask is uh, uh, leaving today. Um, uh, what what's left on your plate to continue doing the work before we really hammer out a policy that the city can be proud of? But as Councilmember Prala said, we don't want to be left behind. Um, I, I think that the state of California or or those uh, around us look at us as leaders in this in this uh, new world of uh, cannabis policies. So what do we still need to do and what kind of direction do you need from us so that I can uh, start thinking of how I make a motion? I mean, I need to take that one, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I was thinking, I think what we want is to kind of get a, your opinion on where we're, what we're recommending because we aren't recommending second retail locations. We are recommending that they move their existing retail locations to the expanded zones. So the, their current retail locations would, would close and they would open retail in a different area. So uh, we're, that, that's what our, what our recommendation is as of today. So if the committee members are thinking something differently then that's what we were you know, hoping to hear some feedback on. Um, and so we've got some feedback now with, with what the sensitive um, the setbacks. And so we'll look at that. Um, we'll kind of, we'll look at the, we'll look at the thousand feet. We'll definitely be looking at the 150 feet and we'll see if we'll uh, change our recommendation. Again, we have the CEQA uh, study that's, that's going to be underway. And then we'll go to the planning uh, commission, hopefully in July and then full council in August. Um, so we'll, we'll look, we'll evaluate what other uh, cities are currently doing. So then as you know, other cities are, are surrounding us are um, proposing changes. We'll look at those, so we'll have some more comparison for when we come back in August to see if our recommendation would change. Um, but again, I mean, I think our big our our big push today was um, allowing our existing 16 to move their retail, allowing uh, cannabis equity applicants to apply uh, for registration in our city. Um, so those, those were our two big recommendations, um, I think in our memo today. Okay. And so, um, uh, and, and I agree with, uh, uh, council member Prowlis that, um, uh, that I'd like to see, uh, uh, us move more in alignment, uh, with the state guidelines. Uh, and in order to do that, what what kind of work would you need to do in order to come back to committee versus going to city council before going to city council i should say i'll just i will share that so for purposes of our CEQA clearance um, we are actually just going to go ahead and analyze the potential environmental impacts of being in alignment with state law when it comes to the the uh the distances so we're kind of giving ourselves some wiggle room that we're not locking ourselves in stone with the CEQA project description. Um, the CEQA clearance we're planning is an initial study, so we'll be circulating it and then likely a negative or a mitigated negative declaration. So I, I will say that, I guess I'm saying that to say there is some, there's definitely room for us to adjust our recommendation. We're not locking ourselves in stone by circulating a CEQA document that says one thing and, it, and council may want to go another. So 
Um, I'll just throw that out there to start with. Yes, so council member, we, I don't believe that we need to come back to this committee again. I think that we can move forward with the CEQA study. And then again, if some of the things that we are looking at are matching the state, our recommendations still very well may be to have more restrictive um, setbacks than the state, but then, um, but then full council can, can you know, make a different recommendation. Uh, but again, we want to we want to look at that first. We want to look at um, what that might mean um, in different communities if we change it from a thousand feet to six hundred feet from schools and libraries and parks and community centers. So we'd want to look at the look at the map and evaluate a little bit closer on that. And then we're going to evaluate again the 150 feet in different uh, methods, path of travel maybe eliminating it altogether. And then we can we can show those recommendations. And then obviously in council members, you write pros and cons kind of with some of your recommendations or alternatives. So we can we can have those included in some of the alternatives in the in the council memo. Again, I I don't think we need to come back to the committee, but maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe and, and, and <laughs> yeah, and those and those areas would be the, the sensitive areas, of course, and I'm sensitive to that as well. And I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, I, I would, um, and you weren't recommending that second location, you were just recommending moving it from their current location to retail. And so, um, so, uh, and, and I don't, I, you know, um, I, I'll tell you, I don't, give, given the fact, uh, the size of our city and, um, you know, I do you see a, an issue with with our current our current um, dispensaries applying for that second location? And, and, and let me say that let, let me tell you where I'm thinking where I'm going with this. And, and like I said, you know, it it took me a while to be here to get here. Uh, I I I I'm not one that was easily swayed. I was not easily persuaded arguments did not work well on me for teenagers i want i want you to think of how persuasive for teenagers can be it 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 took a very long time and a lot of uh research that i had to uh uh make on my own polls didn't persuade me but it also, what was probably the best argument for me at the end of the day was whom I saw filling uh, our jail cells and why they were there. And having a thorough understanding of our history uh, when I finally understood the drug on, the war on, on drugs and, and, uh, and seeing the injustice of it all. And so uh, there's, there's, uh, there's some of that. But anyway, uh, beyond that, when I look at, at the, I hate to be so crass, but when I look at the amount of tax revenues that are being contributed to the city coffers. I hate to get to the, you know, to that kind of nitty gritty kind of stuff, but is $17 million what I'm looking at in terms of the contribution to the city funds? Yeah, the cannabis business tax was 17, are they, projected to be $17 million this fiscal year. The reason, the only reason why I bring that up is because these are business partners with the city of San Jose that, that are contributing, that are providing, and that have shown to be what I consider business partners that help assist and support the city, just like any other business. 
And I know that for some, because I was one of them, it, it can feel icky for lack of a better term, unless you've worked through your own ickiness. And I've worked through it. I had to work through it. And so I sometimes don't understand what some of the stumbling blocks are other than maybe we haven't worked through all our ickiness. And so I just bring that up because I want to understand why we would not suggest or be okay with, or at least look at the possibilities of allowing that second retail license. Unless it's icky. Councilmember Carrasco, do you mind if I jump in for a little bit? I actually think that's our prerogative of this committee to make that instruction. If we want to see our current retailers be able to expand to a different location, then, uh, and, and I would be supportive of that, then your motion should, if you're getting ready to make a motion, then your motion should include that. And the reason uh, I say that is one, it's a, I'm looking at this from an expansion of business and a business opportunity and a way that we can increase city count city revenue. And I know you, you didn't, you don't like to talk about that, but that bottom line is it does create a tremendous income for the city of San Jose that we you can use to offset offset some of our general fund expenses, such as our police and fire and emergency services. So I, I just wanted to lay that out there. Additionally, our current dispensaries, um, it is not as easy at to for them to close up where they currently are and relocate. They may have leases where they are. They may not be able to. It, it still doesn't uh, uh, impact the ability or where they are now to be overly concentrated in district seven, which is really what we need to uh, move move away from. So I just I just wanted to add that as you're going through this. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I, I wanted to give uh, staff an opportunity, but I I, I, I agree with you. Uh, so I, I will make a motion. I'm going to make a motion. I'm actually going to make a motion to come back to committee with some opportunity to do further analysis of, uh, of allowing that second retail um, uh, license, um, also to align the setbacks with those of the state of California. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, still, I'm still okay with the sensitive areas, which include schools and childcare. Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, and I apologize because I, I can't open up my second, um, my second um, uh, iPad, uh, but the sensitive areas that you had mentioned, uh, and um, and you had one other, and I'm sorry because my other uh, pad just went out. So if you could give me that one other piece that you had in mind, the CEQA was it CEQA? The 150 feet from residential is that what you're talking about? The thousand feet. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask you because in your own words, it was a, it was a, uh, a deal, uh, what was it, a business killer. And so I'm very concerned about that, especially in the downtown area. And I'm asking you to look at further analysis for that. Uh, so, and that's why I think, that's why I think that it's imperative that this comes back to committee versus the full council so that we have uh, an opportunity to really weigh in on it and be able to look at it after you're able to have uh, uh, a, a clear picture on that. And, and that's really what did it for me is uh, when you said, you know, this, this could be a uh, deal breaker or a, a, a deal killer, I think you said. And, uh, and that was an, an, alarming, um, an alarming point. So anyway, that, that's my motion. And I hope Council that Member, I did you, Could you clarify your motion? So are you proposing to keep the recommendation of the sensitive um, setbacks uh, to be a thousand feet from public or private preschools, elementary schools, child daycare centers, community and recreation centers, parks and libraries? 
as well as a thousand feet from other dispensaries? Correct. Well, uh, allowing so would include that, but the rest of it uh, uh, aligned with the state of California. Uh, the 150 from residential, I think uh, I would like to see further analysis because uh, I'm concerned that that's going to really limit uh, opportunities for uh, businesses to open up. And a I, second, I get that. I just, I'm just trying to understand it because it'll make the difference whether I can vote for the motion oh. or not. So yeah. that's fine. I'm trying Those sensitive to areas. But, so but it would keep a thousand foot setback. Is that correct? Yeah, in those sensitive areas. Okay. Thank you. But yeah. council member Esparza, it did not include a thousand feet from current dispensary to dispensary. It did oh, not it include did not that. Keep no. a thousand feet from current. And this dispensary. is this is instruction to come back to commit to us to discuss again. Okay. So, so this isn't so, going to council. This is coming back to us. Okay, so I, I guess my question is, I'm not sure how this helps seeing as the majority of ex existing dispensaries are in my district, right? Like that's what we're trying to move from. We're trying to help dispensaries be outside uh, in other, go to other parts of the city. Is that correct? It, it, if we could continue on with um, council member Carrasco's motion and then I'd like to get to council member Mahan and then uh, over to you, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, well, and then uh, the second retail uh, license, allowing uh, our businesses to uh, open up the second retail. And then uh, the 150 feet from residential, uh, I'd like further analysis on that. And then uh, I know that council member Esparza, uh, the concern is how do we get these businesses out of district seven? So. Uh, if you could help me address that within this motion, um, I'd appreciate that because uh, that is the the concern that she has, and so I want to I want to make sure that we get her vote on this one. Well, so so if we the whole zoning change allows these dispensaries to move out of their current locations, but to and if you give them two licenses they can do that over time they can start they can expand their business to another location and consider reevaluating whether they're currently there is still a good business a uh, good place for them to be but they've got many of i don't know what their lease consideration is but i imagine they have all signed leases and they can't get out of their leases very quickly but we've heard from many who really want to locate, relocate, but they just can't do it yet. So, so primarily, uh, ch chair, uh, and council member Carrasco, the second retail is the main difference. I, I just write between what's in the memo and what's in the motion. Is that correct? Yes. And so an analysis of the 150 feet and all that coming back with that. So, okay. So could we just keep what Council Member Carrasco is trying to do and keep keep the setbacks open, add further analysis to the 150 feet and the second retail? Could that be the motion? Sure. Okay. okay. Well, that's effect, yeah. Is I that, think that's effectively what she was saying. If that's the motion, then I can support it. Councilmember Carrasco, are you good? Yeah. Okay. Then uh, Councilman Mahan. Chair, if well, you I don't mind it. I don't think we have a second on the on the motion. Oh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and I'm I'm willing to second it, but quite honestly, I'm a little confused, and so um, <laughs> so so I wanted to just see if I could. Uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to second it, but I, I wanted to. Try to clarify what I'm seconding, if, if that was all right, because I know there there is there is a bit going on here, obviously within the recommendation. So, uh, okay, I'm going to try and paraphrase it. I didn't write it all down, but uh, Yasmin, are you still here? Did you take notes of the motion that we're voting on, or Rosalind, or is there a staff person who's been documenting this? Ba Chair, I can take a stab at it if you like. Okay, to. please. As I've been listening to the discussion, as I understand 
Council Member Carrasco motion is that staff would return to the committee with an analysis on allowing a second retail license for the existing 16 and further analysis on the setback requirement. Of the 150 feet, I wrote that down. Yes, of the 150 feet. Thank you for adding that. And were there any, those super were the specific, main... it was the 150 feet from any residential use. Yes. Correct. Yes. Were there any other elements, um, Council Member Carrasco, that we missed? And and uh, aligning the thousand uh, feet uh, setback with that of California's um, guidelines. So council member, that's why I had clarified the motion was to keep, so the state is 600 feet. What's mentioned in this memo is a thousand foot setback. If it's not a thousand feet, I can't support the motion. So that's why I'm, I'm clarifying um, so would we keep the thousand foot or not on the sensitive uses to public or private preschools, elementary schools, child no, daycare? Centers? We we would keep it in the sensitive areas. Okay. Keep it in okay. the sensitive areas. Outside of the sensitive areas, we would align it with the state of California. So that's the second location issue. That's the thousand foot. Those are those are the two things, right? In terms of the so, so, so sensitive areas across yes, sensitive areas across the city stay sacred, stay sensitive a thousand feet. Anything outside of the sensitive areas would be aligned with the guidelines from the state of California, which is six hundred feet. So in effect, you're just we're just looking at the hundred and fifty feet residential setbacks. And the second retail location. In the second, yeah, yeah. Right, because so the first already. Is that right. correct? It seems odd to me. Well, Chair, who's who's up? Go ahead, you're up. Okay. <laughs> Th turn. Thanks to staff for the report. And you know, generally, generally feeling like we're heading in the right direction, though obviously, um, you know, I'd raised my hand to make the same recommendation that we come back to this committee before going to planning. So I'm glad to hear. That's what we're, that's the motion on the table. It, it does seem a little odd to me to, to, I mean, we can look at the analysis obviously, but to have different setbacks for retail location one and two does seem a little arbitrary. And I'm, I'm a little confused by that notion to, to say for retail location one, it should be a thousand feet from schools, but, but if you have a second location, we'll let it be 600 feet from a school just seems, I feel like that's gonna run into some problems. So uh, maybe there's a different way we can formulate that. Um, understood the point about residential, sounds like that's something worth studying. I think I agree with my colleagues. I, I, I could imagine uh, you know, residents across the city having concerns with it being too close, but I think it's worth the analysis. I think it's worth the conversation. So on, on board with that, certainly. I, I guess the question would be, you know, council member Perales mentioned thinking about downtown differently, and maybe we should think about urban villages differently. And, and as we all know, we have potential urban village sites in every single district in the city. And so I wonder if something we're thinking about is actually, and I'm not quite sure how you would write this ordinance, but it's more about the sort of density and land use, you know, the zoning there, you know, do, do we want to think about denser parts of the city like downtown having more relaxed setbacks? I mean, it sounded to me like that's what Councilmember Perales was pointing to. And so rather than the distinction being between retail location one and retail location two, if we go that route, maybe it has more to do with the underlying zoning um, or, or land use in the city. So I'm, I'm just throwing out ideas. I'm sure staff's going to come back to us. I mean, my, my main point was that I really felt like we were going to need to come back and have a second conversation. So I'm glad it seems like we got there. Um, and I think most of my other questions were actually answered. I did want to ask, you know, there was this point in the memo about the CEQA concern that retailers had raised and, and the, the line in there about work being underway at the state to extend that deadline beyond 2021 seemed a little vague to me. So I was just wondering if we could get some more detail on, it, on exactly what, what, we sh what our expectation is on that issue. 
Yeah, so sure. There's there is a, a state bill that's proposed that it appears it would extend um, the retail licenses. So we're watching that bill and will likely actually send a letter of support for it um, as it moves forward. So that was primar primarily what we're talking about. And yeah, I mean the sequin. If anyone in the industry, I my my you know offer stands, please please email me so we can talk about this separately and try to come up with. A solution. It's a it's a complicated issue because it has to do with the existing businesses that are fully permitted from the city. And what the state wants is to essentially us to undo our permitting and redo it again so that we can do CEQA ourselves that they can then reuse for their licensing because it's actually their license that triggers the CEQA. And under the law, they are the responsible agency for completing the CEQA clearance for their own license. But they would prefer if cities do it for them and they can just reuse it. So that's kind of been their position. And our position has been our businesses are fully permitted through a process that's legal and work. And what you're asking us to do is kind of open up that box again that we, we're not sure we want to open. So so it's I can go on forever. It's, it's a pretty complicated one. But um, I, hopefully we're, we are carefully watching that bill on extending the provisional licenses so that um, there's more time to resolve this issue. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd love to learn more, but I'll save it for another time. Um, and then I think I'm almost done here. If, if we were to go with the with the, the current staff recommendation that would require the, the, the retailer to, um, not require, I'm sorry, allow them to relocate. I didn't see a time limit. Would that Was that just open-ended? Would that time out at some point? How are you thinking about that? I mean, we, we would be working with the businesses to find out because, I mean, like we're saying that we understand that they might have existing um, lease agreements. So we would be looking at that, evaluating that, but we would definitely clearly um, put out there what our registration or application process is for that through our city manager regs. We have that ability for the registration process there. So we would clearly outline that. Um, so, but it would allow you, I mean, we have to kind of, you know, stop it at some point, right? To, so we would open it up and then stop it at some point and then whoever uh, wants to move can move or, um, or if council again votes to allow them to retail locations, then, then that would be um, considered. Right now, part of our, I mean, right now they can have multiple locations for manufacturing and distribution. And so they can either choose to do an application kind of amendment at any point during the year uh, currently, or they can do it as part of their annual renewal process. So it's really up to the business how they want to do it. So I would imagine we would um, look at all types of um, application options for them. Okay. All right, thanks. Well, I'm glad to hear that after some more analysis, we'll talk about this again, but thanks again for all the work and I'll um, stop there, Chair, thanks. Great, thank you. Council Member Esparza, I believe you're next. Um, thank you, I think I'm good. I'm gonna lower my hand. Oh, okay, great. Then Council Member Perales. Thank you. So I, I'm just gonna try to formulate a motion here that might actually uh, get, get, uh, get, get us moving forward. Um, and I think the, the challenge with, um, what it is that the state is is, is allowing um, is is again very very limited restriction in specific cases to schools, daycare centers, youth centers of that 600 foot radius. And I would agree that it, that I don't think it makes too much sense to have uh, a difference of um, from a current use to a business moving to a new use. I think that that it should be similar. And at the same time that I'd like to move closer to what I think, you know, some, some less restrictions, I, I don't want to go all the way to where the state has, has gone. I do think it's worthwhile to look at having some additional restrictions. Uh, but I would say what our staff has proposed with the, the 1000 feet um, for public and private preschools, elementary schools, secondary schools, daycare centers, community and rec centers, parks, or libraries. Uh, I do think that is, you know, it, it's worth sort of taking a look at would we want to you know, change anything there, but I, I, I'm not necessarily advocating for that. For me, it was really advocating um, a change in regards to the, the 150 foot setback from residential use. 
And I know that Councilmember Sparza, I think, sounded like she was concerned about if we were to eliminate the setback uh, suggestion for um, being from another storefront dispensary, the 1,000 feet. And just to confirm that, is that correct, Councilmember Sparza? That was that was a uh, that 1,000 feet setback is something you were interested in keeping in, correct? Yes, if the goal was to actually disperse dispensaries throughout the city, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't add on another layer to conflict with that. Um, and I had another question about the motion, but I'll wait until you're done. Yeah, so, uh, and I, look, I think I'm comfortable with that as well. Again, that's an added restriction that the state doesn't have, but I would agree with you in regards to, you know, is that going to help us get to where the goal that we want to get, which is actually dispersing these these dispensaries, um, you know, a little bit more equitably throughout the city. Uh, and I know we're, we're throwing out the numbers of, of a thousand feet. I think I'm, I'm comfortable with staff uh, coming back and sort of taking a look at um, all of these different parameters, maybe loosening up, uh, whether it is the, the feet or whether it is eliminating in total, for instance, the 150 feet from residential use um I, I i won't say that we should go again to where the state is which is 600 feet from just schools and, and daycare centers i do think we need to keep in some of these additional um uh sensitive uses or sensitive use setbacks like the thousand feet from an additional retail storefront um and and then additionally i do think we need to be looking at areas site specific or zone specific, as Councilman Mahan just pointed out, as I described in the downtown core, and maybe likely in other places throughout the city that are zoned for a specific use, um, where where we may uh, allow for a, an even higher uh, concentration. Uh, I do want to make it specific as well that the the additional I know staff is not recommending this, but I would like to add in the recommendation for the additional uh, location. So not necessarily that we move these 16, but that, that, that you actually have, uh, you can have the opportunity for an additional location. And then lastly, the five new uh, businesses uh, that qualify under an equity uh, plan. And um, I think that there are some, some cautions there. And I know we heard that in the commentary in regards to big businesses piggybacking on somebody that maybe can qualify. Um, and I know that we had to sort of pause that work as we, we did earlier in our agenda today um, and so I just think that, that, you know, we need to be sensitive about that. Um, and all of this is going to come back to this committee anyways. Uh, but I, I think we, we need to include that as well. We need to include that opportunity for those five new sites. So um, in summary, it's, it's uh, looking at minimizing some of these setbacks um, and uh, with an emphasis on removing potentially the 150 feet from any residential use. Uh, an emphasis on keeping the thousand feet for uh, being uh, away from another retail storefront dispensary, and um, and then looking at an expanded use in particular areas like the downtown core. And uh, I don't know if that was any more plus, clear, but plus the expansion of the licenses, additional yeah, locations, plus, yeah, plus and the, the expansion equity. of the. The yeah. second Five location, yeah. yeah. The motion added, and I'd like to second it. I just had one um, question, clarification on the motion. This still includes the um, the exclusion, just like ABC alcohol. It includes um, excluding areas with twenty percent average higher reported crimes, just like we do with alcohol. Is that correct? That still is included. Uh, I would, I would. I would be fine with including it, but not for specific areas. For instance, the downtown core also sort of ranks up in that in that area, and and that might eliminate all of the downtown core. And so right. that's where I think we can marry the two conversations around. You know, do we want to be hard or fast in that rule, or do we want to look at particular areas that you know? Yeah. You see, yeah, and that's where I really appreciate. So I'll, I'll uh, if, if it still keeps the twenty percent, I'll second the motion with the carve out of the downtown core and looking at other locations. Um, because again, there's, uh, this is where our city is so diverse uh, in my part of the city, uh, it, it is an issue, um, but downtown is so unique. Um, we need to allow some flexibility there. Okay, so council member Perales, is that a substitute motion? I don't think the first motion had a second, so I think it's just a regular motion. 
I, <laughs> I thought you seconded it so that we could discuss it. But well, I never got to it. I was trying to. That's why I was trying to clarify what was in it, oh. and so I, 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 you know, and okay. it looked like we weren't going to get there. So sorry. And Matt, okay. Matt uh, had, had his hand raised, so I, I just kept quiet again. That's fine. So your motion is basically uh, okay. Uh, so just to restate, retaining the thousand uh, feet uh, setback for. Uh, for the sensitive areas. Staff is to investigate modifying the 150 foot setback, uh, in residential setback, expand the number of licenses, including additional locations, plus the five equity pieces. They will consider the 20 percent uh, um, uh, crime, but uh, on a case uh, to come back to us with their analysis. So this is really staff is coming back to us in a couple of months with their analysis on what we're suggest we're saying today in your motion. Are we all on the same page with that? If I yeah, understand so correctly, that. both. Oh, sorry, council member. I, I thought that both the twenty percent and the thousand feet for downtown might be carved out or, or analyzed separately as a special zone. Is that correct? 150 feet. I didn't really hear the thousand yeah. feet, but it's going to come back for analysis anyway. So I, I, I think we're, I think we're all on the same page. And downtown is, I think council member man, I think downtown is getting a sort of a separate review. Is that correct? That's, That's my understanding. Okay. Okay. I think we're all there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I, and I would agree with our chair that I think either way we'll be back kind of hashing out maybe a little bit more specifics in a couple months, but yes, council member Mayhan, that, that is the idea. Great. Okay. Rosalind, did you have, you had a, your hand raised. Thank you, chair. I just wanted to also clarify because there was discussion about areas that had more density than others. And I just wanted to make sure included in the motion, I would suggest if you wanted to direct staff to look at our growth areas, such as urban villages, um, I just wanted to be sure that was part of the motion as well. Yes, I, I, I'm using downtown as an example, but the idea would be that, that there could be other locations right around the city that this also makes sense similar to downtown. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, let's vote. Carrasco? Aye. Carrasco? Perales? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. And Foley? Aye. Thank you. Chair, you are on mute. Now, how did I do that? You think I've been doing this for 100 years, and I know enough not to do that. I really appreciate the discussion we had around that issue. and know that it will come back and we'll continue to have this discussion until we go to council. And I'm, I'm really glad that we pulled this off the backlog and we're able to move it forward through the committee. So th thank you for that really uh, good, good discussion and, and motion crafting. All right, final item is on the city council policy priority number one, local hiring. Thank you. We, I assume we have a presentation on that. Do we? Yes. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Foley. Um, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, and with me today is Chris Hickey, Division Manager and, from Public Works, and Sebastian Green, a Stanford Fellow in our department that's been helping us with this issue. Um, I'll turn the presentation over to uh, Chris in a second, um, but just wanted to mention, as, a, as stewards of a multi-billion dollar capital improvement program in the city, it's important for us to not only um, focus on how or focus on the, what we build, but it's also important to focus on how we build that and how do we engage our community to enhance um, their economic and job opportunities as part of these funds that we're the stewards of. It's very, very, very important to us um, for not just local workers, which this presentation is about, but also for the local businesses. Um, and, and we take that um, very seriously. Um, 
This item is currently on the city's roadmap as backlog item number four. However, we have been collecting data and any addition, but well, we have been collecting data on it. And so we felt it was important that even though it's on the backlog, it was important for us to come and present the data that we have to keep that discussion at the forefront of people's minds um, for if and when there's an opportunity to provide additional funding um, to actually to move this initiative forward. And so with that, I'll turn that over to Chris Hickey uh, for the rest of the presentation. Hello, uh, committee uh, chair and council members. Uh, Chris Hickey, Department of Public Works. Um, we're here today. Uh, the recommendation is in front of you, um, and it's and to accept and provide feedback on this report regarding local worker participation on City of San Jose Public Works uh, construction projects. Um, as Matt stated, um, this was reprioritized um, from the 2020. 2021 uh, council priority uh, number one to the city's roadmap backlog of uh, number four. So as Matt said, we just want to kind of give you a background, bring this up um, because it is very, very important to public works and the city. So again, previously uh, it was council priority number one. Uh, it included local hiring, local business and apprenticeship utilization. So three very large things in one, um, local hiring uh, reg in regards to our construction contracts uh, that the city puts out for our public works. Um, that would be the workers, the actual employees, local businesses would be the employee, uh, the companies that would be building our projects as well as apprentice utilization. So trying to get, uh, you know, building up the industry um, as we go forward. So. In an effort to make any type of gains in this, uh, the city uh, executed a project labor agreement uh, with the Santa Clara County, Santa Benito County's Building Trade Council. That's for most projects over $3 million um, are, are subject to the PLA requirements, which have local unions providing the workforce. So that had a, a rather a large impact uh, to our local workforces. Um, as well as in October 8th, uh, City Council approved the Public Works Contracting Program. Uh, many of our council members uh, have been notified from Public Works about our Construction Academy in which we try to bring in as many new local and small businesses, train them, educate them on how to do business with the city. Um, and they, they learn all of this through uh, deputy directors as well as uh, division managers throughout Public Works. Um, and we go through a whole bunch of training. So we're, we're making efforts in that. And so what we decided to do was how can we identify or what should we be identifying when it comes to our local employees? So the Office of Equality Assurance and Public Works, we started collecting data between December 2019 and January 2021. We assembled the data set containing zip code information on our public works construction projects. We took that information and made a geographic distribution of all the project work hours based off of zip codes. And then we also took a look at, you know, what are called journeymen or, uh, you know, fully educated uh, construction workers, as well as apprentice utilization. So training uh, of the next generation. So we took a look at all of those. So what we found was that our local ratio of workers and our local for Santa Clara in San Jose is actually deemed as Santa Clara County. So our ratio of local workers <clears throat> is relatively pretty high. Uh, you know, we had a peak uh, sometime in June. Again, our construction industry um, is seasonal. W when it's raining, we're not really constructing a lot. Um, when it's uh, warmer outside, better weather, we have a lot of our pro projects going on. So you see it, you know, through this April, May, June, even in July, we have very, very good uh, numbers for our local workers. As we start to go through the seasons um, and we start hitting this, you know, winter time frame, we start to see some type of leveling off. Why this is important is the public works. Uh, we actually went out and benchmarked against some of the other cities in the state of California um, to see where other cities with local higher policies, where they sit on uh, their ratios. So we found two very, very close um, partners. Uh, that would be the city and county of San Francisco, as well as the city and county of Los Angeles. Both of them have mandatory local hire policies. 
both cities and counties, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles, they mandate 30% of their project hours are um, completed by local residents. So based off of our current numbers, we are in line with our you know, our sister agencies in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So we're right on that level par uh, with everyone. So we decided what's the next step? If it's not just the local workers, can we start looking at additional information that we're collecting? So we found and started looking at apprenticeship utilization. Um, so apprentices are an extremely important part of the industry, the construction industry. Um, it's really setting up that next generation uh, to go through that next step, to become journeymen, to be working on our public works construction projects. As you can tell, you can see that, again, very similar to the rest of our, um, you know, employees on our projects, local employees. We saw a pretty good percentage of apprentices, um, local apprentices on our construction projects. Again, it it was pretty high numbers um, during the great seasons that we see uh, through April through August. Um, you started to see some slight declines and then you saw some very large declines. So we're starting to see that apprenticeship utilization is actually being lowered um, with all of our construction projects. There's a lot of different things that could be happening here. We have not been able to identify any specific reason of this um, at this point. However, with that said, there's still some options and actions that we can do. So for our public works construction projects, public works will continue to track our local worker ratios and our local apprenticeship ratios. We will report on it annually, trying to, we're, what we're trying to say is, we're trying to make sure that the 30% is accurate we're trying to make sure that the 30% uh, goals are continuing, that we're not seeing any sharp uh, declines or even inclines. Um, and then we also need to assess, and we'd like to assess whether or not the 30% goal is that healthy equilibrium uh, for our city, for our region. Again, we benchmarked against San Francisco and LA, but um, it would be nice to actually take a look at the city itself. Um, potentially, there's some work there. Additionally, apprenticeship hours. Um, so we'd like to seek opportunities to partner with our pre-apprenticeship programs um, to increase opportunities for local workers to receive apprenticeships um, and other opportunities. So, you know, pre-apprenticeship -appre pre programs, um, you know, the city has some experience with it. Our Work to Future um, group uh, works with TOPS, Trades Orientation Program, uh, with our Building Trades Council. And so working with uh, organizations like the TOP program, as well as some of the other uh, pre-apprenticeship programs would really allow us to understand, you know, if the city can, you know, step foot into that uh, realm to potentially help uh, with uh, their type of resources or even providing educational support. So that's an additional step. And our conclusion. Um, so our local hours ratios closely match the percentage goals for San Francisco and Los Angeles counties. Our local apprenticeship ratios could be improved. We believe based off of the numbers that we can improve those. Um, and staff will continue to monitor local and apprenticeship ratios. And lastly, um, the city will continue to partner with our local apprenticeship organizations to identify those opportunities um, and to try to either enhance, continue, um, or just support uh, the relevant programs that really, you know, help the construction industry um, in our community. So with that, um, that is the end of our presentation. Staff is here for any questions um, or any discussions that we can provide to you. Great, thank you very much. First, I will go to members of the public. Again, please focus your comments specifically on the local hire uh, presentation that we just heard. Uh, Mr. Sansini, 5140. Do we really need another program in this city? Really? I mean, budget shortfalls and we got to help people help employers to help people find jobs. I find it a bit odd. There's four 
there's uh, there's wanted signs uh, every, everywhere for jobs, and uh, we we need to have another program. Who's going to pay for all this? There's all these wonderful things going on here in this city that are being paid for by the taxpayer. All these committees, all these things for for what? If people want to get a job, they go online or they go to the place and they where there's a help wanted sign. We're going to hold people's hands to do this? Why? What? Why do we, as a taxpayer, why do we have to fund every little thing for, for people who should be able to find themselves a job? I mean, right now, if you watch the news or look in, in the Mercury News, they have a shortage of restaurant workers. They can't find people to staff at $15 an hour with no experience. They actually had to raise – can you imagine they had to raise the uh, pay? For these restaurant restaurant workers, because they can't find any, but but this city has to develop some sort of plan. This is like the communist Chinese government. My God, you guys are going down the way of socialism, and uh, it's pretty clear with all the legalization of marijuana and all these things. This, this is all going down the road of socialism, and you guys don't see. You keep doubling down on stupid ideas, mass transit, uh, coffin condos. 600 square feet condos in these new villages. I this is local hire that we're discussing now. We're not talking about Yeah, I know, but it's all, it's, all, it's all tied together, Pam. It's all tied together. What, what you sir, Answer my question. Why does the city have to pay for anything to find someone a job? Answer me that, and then, I'll, then you can cut me off, as you always do. Mr. Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, the one, two in abstractions today, you get uh, the abstract group today to address, uh, you know, these important issues of our time in city government and community. <laughs> Hi. Um, you know, I, I, I do feel from the words of the previous speaker that, uh, you know, there's important connections in, in this work and this effort that's going on right now and how it connects to things. I was going to offer for this item, you know, we're trying to address our young people at this time and what can they do in this era of COVID and, and what, are, what are the steps we, were we are taking to get, get out of this era and just to be, um, I don't know, friendly with ourselves and, 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 and building community with ourselves and uh programs like what you talked about here for this item are doing that and i just wanted to thank yourselves for it and thank you for the efforts uh you know uh, we really do have socialistic questions we have to address with the future of covid and i i i hope we're not afraid to ask those questions and it's difficult, and I wish it didn't have to be in this difficult sort of setting. <laughs> I think we could have asked these same sort of questions without a, having to perform a major pandemic. But we are here now at this time, and we're here to ask ourselves important questions of, of socialism for our future. And we, and we are at the time to start asking ourselves openly as a community process what exactly those questions are. I feel this particular item addresses perfectly you know, the ideas of how to uh, help each other and work with each other to build that sustainable future that we need. And uh, so thank you for this item and, 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 our, and our work together at this time. Thank you. Uh, going back to the committee then, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate having this come back to us. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, say a couple of things. So one is I love the apprentice programs. I'm just going to share my own experience with the apprentice and the pre, sorry, the pre-apprentice programs. Um, uh, for having formerly worked with homeless veterans, um, we were able to get dozens, dozens of veterans um, into this pipeline, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, and I know that their efforts to recruit foster youth, um, justice impacted youth, 
um, and there are other efforts out there with apprentice programs. So I think the, um, the opportunities that are posed with the apprentice programs um, are great, really great opportunities to, for folks to be able to change, um, to, ch to make changes and to realize opportunities um, for better paying jobs. Um, I wanted to offer um, also though, I, um, I think what local hire was trying to get at, I know this predates me a little bit, but the issue has also been around a really long time, um, is how basically we can promote equity, right? We have projects where, um, where local dollars are being spent, where the city is involved, and we want to make sure that the people who live in our city are able to, to or live in our county are able to stay in our county. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask was how we could, how we could create a type of equity lens, um, perhaps instead of local hire, to really get at that equity issue in terms of folks who are being priced out of the area and, and commuting from Los Baños and Tracy and God knows where um, else to come and do jobs here. Is there another way that we can apply an equity lens to really get at what local hire is trying to do? I'll, I'll let Chris uh, take first response to that. Yes, thank you, council member. Um, yes, um, that is a, uh, if, if we had, you know, a couple hours uh, to chat here today, um, and I'm totally open for that. Um, there's a lot uh, when it comes to local hire. Uh, you are correct. Uh, local hire was actually first put on the council priority list in 2015 um, by a uh, former council member, uh, uh, Cholera. Um, it's been moving along. We've done two studies, technically. Um, one study prior to COVID, and then we had another um, uh, vendor bring review that study. Um, yes, uh, housing is a rather large problem. Uh, the industry itself, um, you know, you have to go through these pre-apprenticeships. You have to go through an, uh, an approved apprenticeship program to become a journeyman. Um, and a journeyman is where you actually make, you know, a, more money, uh, good money, especially in uh, public works construction. Um, so yes, there, there's quite a lot uh, that we can do when we look at an equity-based or putting an equity uh, lens on it. Um, there have been things that we've already started discussing uh, within public works. Um, so, you know, uh, preferences uh, on minor public works construction projects for local um, businesses. Um, you know, typically a local business will not go and hire from Sacramento for their local construction business. Uh, they will typically utilize uh, the region around them. Um, so there's that. We also have, you know, we're starting uh, the process public works on best value contracting, uh, which would also add those, uh, you know, potentially add the, that type of lens into that uh, conversation. There's Again, lots of different aspects that we can try. Um, COVID, I will say though, COVID-19 really kind of threw a wrench into it. What, when, as we're looking at this data, um, you know, it's data through COVID. Is there, you know, since the construction industry was considered an essential service during COVID, did we not see the impacts? Should we have seen additional impacts um, that we're not seeing because of, uh, of you know, being an essential business. Um, those things, and this is why it's this coming back uh, to this committee now was so important. Uh, getting the direction from our council members, uh, from this committee on where we should be going, where we should be looking at. Um, adding an equity lens is definitely something we can try to identify and bring forward in our annual reporting. And I just want to add to what Chris said, we are collecting zip code information as well. And so we do have um, that that would help us in a future equity discussion. Yeah, and, and I'd also um, want to clarify that, sorry, uh, Sebastian Green, Public Works, can you guys hear me at all? Yes. yes. Um, we just clarify um, with regard to equity that local hire is preventative, it's not ameliorative. So um, it's, it's meant to make sure that folks who are at risk from being displaced um, have access to jobs and well-paying careers. It's not a policy designed to bring folks back who have been displaced, but obviously that's incredibly important. 
and just wanted to introduce that language as a framing device. Understood. Uh, thanks, that's it for me. Thank you. Council Member Perales. Yeah, um, I guess I, I, first off, you know, appreciate staff bringing back this work. This has been some time coming. It has been, a, you know, a, a top priority. And I think, unfortunately, um, has been a little bit more nuanced than any of us uh, had pre predicted um, as we entered into it. And um, I think for, for that matter, certainly even in the conversation that Council Member Sparza was just mentioning, um, could shift yet again in what we're really looking to accomplish. And so I didn't, uh, Council Member Sparza, you didn't make a motion there, but I know staff is looking at least for direction in the in the memo that they have did you want to suggest an addition to that yeah i'd like to add the equity lens i wanted to hear from my colleagues but i i would like to add the equity lens to see if there was another way or um just another way to get at sort of what we were trying to do or way back or what former council member Kara and all of us were when we prioritized this a uh, couple years you know kept kept this on the priority list. Um, and so, yes, I would like to include that as well as hear what others think about it. Okay, yeah, and, and I would support that. I guess my question would be for staff because I'm just a little concerned that, you know, how, how are, far off track would that delay us in the work that, you know, we've been trying to achieve here with an actual local hire policy and, and trying to identify, you know, the, the parameters in one if we were to now begin to shift focus and say, let's let's now look at having an equity lens, and then maybe we're we're going to move away from this the parameters of a local hire ordinance, and and try to um, achieve that, you know, the the worker retention um, in the area here through maybe another means outside of local hire. What what does that look like? I, I you just answered in regards to you know the ability to maybe take a look at this. Uh, but could you give me a, uh, an answer in regards to what that looks like or what that could look like as far as timing or, you know, shifting the complete focus here? Or do you think it's in line with some of the work you've already been doing? And I'll, I'll give it a shot. And Chris, please feel free, to, feel free to disagree. That's the problem being virtual. You can't elbow each other when you disagree. Um, but I, I feel that it's in line with what we're doing. Um, any, anything we actually do moving forward will require us to get funding, either either funding to provide to other organizations to support local hire or funding for a staff member on our team to focus on it. So right now we are really in that kind of continuing to track data and continuing to look for opportunities that maybe we can do with our existing resources. And so um, since we are working on tracking zip code information, um, the equity, um, I know equity isn't just about zip codes, but it'd be very helpful in, in any, if we were able to get, let's say, limited funding for part, to work with partners in the, in the future, we could focus it on those zip codes where the data is showing us we have the, um, the worst uh, discrepancies um, between local and outside. So I see it very aligned with what we're doing. Okay. Uh, uh, so, remember, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Me, if you don't mind me adding to that uh, just a little bit. Um, and I saw Johnny uh, went away, but local hire, uh, to your point, has many nuances and, and three major nuances um, are three constitutional issues uh, that we run into. Um, zip code data, uh, identifying zip codes that are either have the most underrepresented, underutilized um, workforces that is actually within underneath the constitutional issue um so that direction in my for me going forward would be very beneficial um and it would not slow us down it would actually probably help uh, the situation going forward but then again to matt's point um the funding is a major uh resource uh that we would need to be able to to handle that for example san francisco's uh, local hire policy they gave us a rough estimate of one FTE for every $500 million ongoing. And they have approximately four to five staff doing this work um, just on local hire. That's not including the prevailing wages or any of that. So just to kind of give you that, that ballpark, but that direction would be very good for us. Okay. That was a very explicit plea for help. Uh, <laughs> make it. <laughs> so noted uh 
and we have a budget discussion coming up where I think, you know, we've, we've had this discussion before, right? You can put our money where our mouth is if this truly is still the number one priority, right? That's uh, been on that list, even though it's been right, kind of backlogged, at least for this coming year. Um, I would agree if it needs some funding, uh, let's just say message heard and, and, and that'll be something that, that I know myself and my colleagues can advocate for in the budget. So I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation with just the one addition as Councilmember Esparza was elaborating on, on developing uh, an equity lens on this workforce data. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, great. Is there any further discussion? Then let's vote. Carrasco. Carrasco. Morales? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. And Foley? Aye. Thank you. And so thank you. So concludes our agenda. Now we have time for open forum. I see one person with their hand raised. Uh, Mr. Beekman, this is the opportunity to speak on any item. Hi, thank you. Uh, public, public agenda, I guess uh, uh, open forum time. I wanted to first thank yourselves that on open forum uh, on your agenda this week, you had a letter from the public that uh, spoke about, um, I can't remember, boy, my, my mind freezes at times like this, I wish it didn't, but it was interesting item. Uh, and I, I just wanted to thank yourselves that you at least, or it's a familiar item, maybe that's a better way to put it. And I wanted to thank yourselves that you at least, uh, you put it in the open forum uh, as letters from the public. I think that's an interesting way to work. I hope you can continue to work that way. Um, to mention a few items from my uh, first uh, public comment uh, on approval of the work uh, agenda. Um, I, I, you know, my words about earthquake, you know, there's also uh, sea level rise and wildfire issues. Those are the big three that I think uh, we have to really consider in San Jose. And uh, if not just for San Jose, you know, maybe my words have been meant for Southern California and LA. Maybe the big earthquake is in, in LA. I'm not exactly sure, but I, I, we do need to really prepare, I feel. And I, I hope you can be really patient with my words and, and, and speak to my words uh, right back to me, you know, exactly what I'm saying so we can be clear and I don't have to continue to rant about things. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be irresponsible, irresponsible about what I'm trying to pass along and talk about. And uh, to conclude, uh, yeah, I, I thank you uh, for your last item. I, it's a real hopeful item, I think, and it's a real way to uh, consider Consider the future of our city, and thank you for talking about it in terms of equity. And uh, yeah, it's 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 good, important stuff that uh, I, I hope we can learn to talk more about uh, this summer. Thank you. Thank you, person with the phone number last four digits five one four zero. We can't hear you. San Jose is in a brave new world, man. Doling out marijuana near the schools, near people's homes. This is going to be, this is a class act by you people. Anyone out there who smokes marijuana, imagine when you buy it from these dispensaries, you're feeding the, you are filling the trough for these cops and these politicians. You're just filling it up for them, giving them more. So every time, just like Malcolm X said, every time you smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol, you're feeding the oppression. And that's, and that's what you're doing because this way they can have more code enforcement people out looking at flagpoles and people's sheds. Uh, they can you know, help these kids find work. Hey, maybe these kids that need to find work when they turn 18, you guys can train them to, to work at these pot shops, right? You can train them to do that. There's a career selling marijuana legally. Uh, you know, in, in some uh, pot store, that, that'll be good. Or maybe they can become code enforcement because we need more, we need more of those little Eichmanns running around in their, in their little Priuses, you know, telling everybody that it's not, uh, it's, it's the neighbors who are telling on each other. It's not that, no, it's them. 
right? That's the psych right there, right? That, that the code for, oh, hey, it's your neighbor who called. Well, how come I can't find out? Don't I have a right to my accuser? No, not with code enforcement. Hey, man, it's not us. It's them, right? So that's disgusting. That's, you guys should – there should be an ordinance against it. Whoever complains, you should know who your, who your accuser is. These city ordinances are the most fascistic things there are labeled with, a, with, with this zen, right, this, this, this nicey nice talk. You guys are disgusting. Everyone at that city council member, all the city council members in UPAM Foley, you guys need to find other jobs because how you guys are doing this is terrible. And by the way, Pam, the burned out building on Hillsdale, maybe you can maybe you can have a, a monster pot store there. Do something with that building, for God's sake. It looks like Detroit in this neighborhood. Pam Foley represents the, the most ghetto district there is, bad roads. Burned out buildings, burned out homes. Thank you. That's it. Thank you for an interesting conversation. We'll see you next time.